Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to the continuation of our board workshop. Dr. Baker. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to lead you in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So I have the pleasure of getting started this morning on day two of our board workshop after a really terrific day yesterday of um, focusing on academics, which started with student data and thinking about the student, our students' experience through this pandemic. Um, some great perspective from our school teams, teachers and principals, um, hearing about our youngest learners and the refunding application for Head Start, a school reopening update, and a really um, awesome update on the work that is being done in our Office of Curriculum Instruction and Professional Development around equity. And so today is a continuation of our conversation around excellence and equity um, as we move into the business of the district that supports all of our academic efforts. So today we're, we'll hold a conversation and hear from staff around budget engagement and the process that is um, around our LCAP, but additional, additional budget engagement. Um, we'll hear from our facilities team on aspects of the district's master plan and work that they have been working on. We'll hear from Mr. Zaid around human resource services and their work around excellence and equity. And we'll end our morning around language accessibility and a conversation for the board to have about moving forward in language accessibility. Um, and before I turn over to Mrs. Craighead, I do want to acknowledge the team from Marketing and Media who is here with us in the room, some in the room and I think some back at the office running all of the, the ways that our public gets to engage with this process with us and record and um, help us to make everything happen, as well as our translation team. We have Spanish and Kamai and ASL translators that are really making the, this information accessible to our community and so grateful for all of them who are in the room with us today. And so with that, as we kick off um, our day of excellence and equity and talking about business perspectives, I know Mrs. Craighead has a way to start the meeting related to yesterday, so I'll turn it over to her. Thank you, Dr. Baker. Uh, yes, yesterday was a packed day and we didn't get to everything on the agenda. So this morning we're going to take just a few minutes to talk about our experience yesterday and in order to facilitate a uh, smooth meeting I have handed out green cards <coughs> to my colleagues so when you have a question or you would like a turn to talk if you could just hold that up a little because we're spread out and it's hard for me to see. When we're online, I rely on, <laughs> you know, checking the little squares on the screen or getting text from uh, Brent letting me know somebody's waiting to say something. So I thought, well, let's use this system. The cards happen to be green. I did it for green means go, but actually being St. Patrick's Day, I think it kind of works out. So, um, we will go ahead and start with a discussion, but let's kind of try and keep our comments brief so we can get right into the uh, substance of the meeting today. So who would like to go first on uh, reflections for yesterday's meeting? Oh, oh. let me use my fancy card here. <laughs> uh, okay, Mr. I just Miller, put we'll, it start, up for the, yeah. we'll start with you and then we'll go to Ms. Kerr. Uh, one of the things that I thought about after yesterday's uh, presentations is that <clears throat> one of the moments I remember most was when we talked about um, the painting. And so the painting with the quilt and the uh, iconic African-American women who were uh, embodied on that image. And so uh, when we were talking about cultural biases in education, or at least that was the undertone of it, right? Uh, one of the things that my wife helped bring to my attention is as when I gave my reflection of who I saw on that image, I spoke to the African-American icons that I recognized because of my education, not knowing that the uh, 
Caucasian gentleman in the back was supposed to symbolize Van Gogh. And for me, that was the, uh, I guess you can call once again the cultural bias that I grew up in in regards to my ability to recognize people from the uh, historical, historical teaching from my background. And so I think that those cultural biases are very evident in the way that we learn as well uh, in regards to uh, the expectations of knowledge. And I think that that example was a prime uh, well, I think that that situation was a prime example of how, their, how your personal cultural biases can uh, depict your aptitude to a certain extent. As I think that there were many that questioned, how did he not see Van Gogh? Because I saw Mary McLeod Bethune, who some may not have saw. So I think that uh, that was just one great example that will help us further the push for equity and excellence. So. It was just something that came to mind when I first thought of yesterday. Good morning. Um, part of my process as a board member is I'm a note taker. I don't always ever look back at my notes, but it's one of the ways that I capture what I'm thinking or feeling in the moment. And after the equity conversation with curriculum, I knew I was missing a page and I couldn't find something that I had written during um, the presentation about Washington Middle School. Um, but it was the note that we ended on yesterday, which is the kind of why now question. And two things that I made of note in the moment um, around the conversations happening at Stevens, but more importantly, or the bigger work that we're looking to do and the why now, and I did write this in the middle of the day, it's on the back side of something else. I said, they've been trying to tell us for decades, these kids and it was around the student polling question. And the system hasn't been responsive. Maybe it's been listening. <clears throat> it's definitely been asking, but it's been unable to respond in a significantly meaningful way for a long time. That we've made small, consistent gains, but it's never been enough. Because we've leaned into systems that were never designed to meet the needs of all. And this moment, and this work, and the curriculum work is part of the way that it feels like we're meeting a moment that's long past due. And you know, the why question is a why question that we can ask for a really long time. And one of the things in the board work that I'm doing with the cohort with Council of Great City Schools that supports the work that we're doing as a board is that idea of I statements. So what haven't I done to make this work possible um, in my time and being honest and real about that? And I think that's something that you know, all of us need to reckon with. And part of it is being part of a system with strong traditions. It's being part of a system that hasn't bent the way that it needs to bend to meet the needs of students. Um, so I take responsibility for my piece in that as a leader, as a parent for 20 years in the district. What didn't I do? What could I have done more of? Um, and what will I do now? So, I just wanted to acknowledge that that's part of the why. And so working you know, and having this conversation with Dr. Kale for the last several months, this feels like a big thing. And, and for me, that's my why. That's my I statement about the work. So I wanted to share that yesterday, but I couldn't find the paper because I had so many notes. And just a shout out um, to that team for bringing that out. And the other reason I think Ms. Traver said it really well, which is the bumps along the way, that as we do this work, we are a system full of humans who are hopeful, my experience of humans in this district, who are hopeful and flawed and wanting to do great work, but not always having the tools or the power um, to do it because it requires self-reflection and it's hard. Um, so I think for me, my reflection on yesterday um, was the work that I need to do within the system and to support the system to make the changes that we need to make. Okay, it looks like we're ready to uh, move on with the agenda. So we start with 
the budget engagement update. We start all over. <laughs> Good morning, board members, um, members of staff, members of the community who will be watching um, this presentation. I'm really pleased to kick off this discussion about budget engagement with you, particularly within the context of these past days um, in which we've really focused on excellence and equity um, in the school district. Because the budget, and quite frankly, the development of the budget should really be a reflection of our beliefs, of our goals, and our priorities. And so, and, and particularly now, our focus on advancing excellence and equity um, within, the, within the school district. And so we find ourselves at a very pivotal time when it comes to the budget. So it's a time of great opportunity, as well as continuing challenge. So great opportunity, we know about the infusion of a large amount of federal funding to really meet our immediate needs within the school district. But we also, on the other hand, face our um, continuing structural issues within our budget precipitated by declining enrollment and continuing rising of our school district expenses. So it's a time um, that we really need to plan to have a really good plan to invest the funding that we have been given and that we will be getting um, to really invest in high quality strategies that will advance excellence and equity within our school district. And it's also a time to really prioritize our activities that we hope to maintain and sustain well into the future. And so the voice of our community in crafting these plans on both fronts for now and for the future is really vitally important. And so it is my pleasure um, to introduce Lucy Salazar, our Director of Organizational Equity and um, Engagement, as well as Robert Tagorda, Executive Director, Equity Access College and Career Readiness, and Renee Arcus, our Executive Director of Fiscal Services, our cross-departmental team to really talk about our budget engagement efforts. So I'll hand it off to them. This is good. Can you hear me? Yes, okay, good. So thank you, Yumi. Um, good morning, board member, President Kerr, board members, Dr. Baker, executive staff, colleagues, and to the LBUSD community who is watching us this morning on YouTube, thank you for joining us. We're glad to be back and to share with you our journey and our efforts to engage the community to determine budget recommendations since we last were with you in August. It seems like such a long time ago. And our journey can best be described and framed as a continuous improvement cycle, where we plan, where we do, where we study, and where we act. Today, to help me, as Yumi mentioned, to help me share this journey with you, um, you'll hear from Robert and you'll hear from Renee later on today. And together we're here to discuss how our team engaged our community, particularly during this challenging time. Let's see. Yay, okay. So in our time with you, I will remind you of the engagement um, framework and the timeline used that brought us here today. And later, Robert will be able to share with you and you'll be able to hear from him what we learned from the community, in particular, their expressed needs and recommendations. And I'd like to share that our intent was to present to you all these recommendations during the board workshop in November, but we were delayed. And that's okay, because the delay has allowed us today to share two things with you. One is that some of, one will be some of the ways that our departments who have had a chance to review these recommendations have taken action. But a second 
thing we'd like to share with you today is that you can look forward to a budget engagement community report. And this report um, will include an overview of the community engagement framework that we used, our timeline along with some highlights of our over 14 engagement sessions that we held through this process. This report will also include the superintendent advisory committee recommendations. And in addition to that, we are able to include the ways in which the different departments have taken action some of which you heard yesterday during the presentations. And we feel that it's important to share this with you today so that everyone here, as well as our community, can expect to see it posted on our website in the days to come. Equally, we share, that th we share this today because we feel that it is very important to acknowledge our community's willingness to engage, to show up, and to share with us what their needs are. So we want to acknowledge and thank their time, thank them for their time, and we know that we are not done. Again, there's a continuous improvement cycle. We've done some plans. We've done some work. We've studied the work. We've studied their input. And we're not done acting. So finally, to, um, at the end of our presentation, you'll be able, you'll be able to hear from Robert um, how the budget improvement started last year, how this budget process really started last year. And it yielded a lot of community input, which we carry forward. He'll share how the work of the past is present and it's moving us forward into our timeline with the LCAP for 2021-22. But before I begin, and before I have my colleagues come up here and share with you, I'd like to share with you a little um, bit about the budget engagement framework that we used. So last July, sorry. So last July, our team presented the framework during a board workshop much like today. And the framework calls out two important things to this process. One is to engage with the community and to gather as much information from as broad of an audience as possible. And two, it was to activate a key group, which is a, a superintendent's advisory um, committee. And in their advisory capacity, they will work and they continue to work with Dr. Baker on key actions. So within this framework, we set out to cultivate, to maintain, and to grow collaborative relationships with our community groups. And we wanted to have ample opportunity for the community to provide input on three guiding questions or budget priorities that centered on academic progress and academic supports, social emotional learning, student motivation and engagement. You may ask, so where did these budget priorities come from? How were they identified? And I wanna take you back to before we started this budget engagement framework. We analyzed two sets of data from two key surveys that were deployed and sent out to our families. One was the distance learning survey, and the other was the Long Beach, um, the LBUSD family needs survey, which we co-created with community members. So with this framework, we had an action plan to get in, so that we can get into and create spaces so that we could be with our community for a very specific purpose. So from mid-August to about mid-December, we moved into the do part of our continuous improvement cycle. And we met virtually with district and community stakeholder groups. Who did we meet with? We met with DLAC, we met with DCAC, we met with CAC, we met with the Kamai Parent Association, we met with Long Beach PTA, we met with CAP, the Coalition of Informed African American Parents, we met with the Pacific Islander Education Voyage Group, and we met with the superintendent student advisory committee. We held two community forums, one in September, one in August, I'm sorry, October. And we used Thought Exchange as a school-wide, district-wide survey to gather data during, the, during most of our sessions. But we also set up for the community a Thought Exchange so that anyone at any time during our engagement process can access Thought Exchange and share their thinking. We recognize that some of our parents did not necessarily want to participate in a Zoom virtual session, and so Thought Exchange gave them the opportunity to share their thoughts and to rate the thoughts of others, much like you do on Yelp. So also at the suggestion of the board, we also established a budget engagement hotline so that anyone who wanted to use a traditional mode of providing input to us had access to do so. So in all, we can see here on this timeline that based on the Thought Exchange alone, we had close to 5,000 participants um, with just as many thoughts shared. 
but I think what is really outstanding is the amount of rating and interaction with those thoughts that occurred just alone on thought exchanges. Again, we held over 14 meetings or sessions with our community, and we really want to be able to thank all of them. We also, um, at early in the process, we didn't use thought exchange. And again, this is a learning process. This is, um, this is one of those bumps where we figured uh, we need to um, find a easier way to be able to um, collect the data, the great and the rich data that was being generated by our groups. So for groups such as DLAC and DCAC, the PTA and the Kamai Parent Association, we collected their input by taking notes and we took information from them using Google Forms during the meeting. So all in all, we gained a deeper understanding of what is important to our community. We gathered our information, we studied what the community had to say about academic supports, social emotional learning, and student motivation and engagement. At the end, at the very center, you see SAC in that triangle, the superintendent's advisor committee. And what we did was we presented to th that data to them for their review. We presented it as much as they wanted or as little as they wanted, and we got that feedback from them. We asked them, how do we best prepare for this working session you will engage in so that you can make solid recommendations based on what the community is sharing with us? And they said, give it to us as many ways as you can, and so we did. So we gave it to them, very holistic, 30 level, 30,000 level overview, but also the opportunity for them to dig in deep if they needed to. And so once we presented to the superintendent advisory committee for their review, they had a working session where they crafted recommendations for your review that we would have loved to have brought to you in November. But that's okay because the work hasn't stopped and we've held on to that information. And again, I would like to thank all the departments that have had, had chance to review those recommendations and act upon them. So to share what we learned and to hear more about the work that the uh, Superintendent Advisory Committee engaged in, I'd like to hand off to Robert Tagorda to share more about our findings. Good morning. Uh, I have the privilege of sharing with the board and the community the outcome of this engagement process, which as you can see here has been a year long process for us to get to this point. Um, you can actually even go all the way back to when we were preparing for the previous local control and accountability plan, which is basically the plan that we submit to the state of California in conjunction with our district budget and all of the work that the district had put together to ensure that schools continued with the educational experiences of our students during the pandemic and ultimately to get us to this point. I'm gonna point out a couple of things here before I proceed to the actual recommendations because I wanted to highlight for the board the idea that as we continue to receive feedback from stakeholders, every step along the way, we're utilizing these ideas not only to um, synthesize them for decision makers, but also to activate upon them right away as circumstances warrant. And it enables our school system to be flexible, to be dynamic, to be responsive to the needs of our parents and our students. So you can see at the top of this timeline that as we were developing the recommendations from the, the superintendent's advisory committee through our thought exchange surveys and through community forums, we were also developing our learning continuity and accountability plan, which is effectively our school uh, opening and safety plan, right? It's a required CDE document that mirrors all of the school reopening updates that you received yesterday. At the same time, there was a budget overview for parents that we had to submit to the uh, state of California, and that also reflected feedback that we had been receiving. All of which is to say that as we're receiving all of the input from the community, we're utilizing it to the degree that we can in the immediate term to address the specific needs of our students now. 
but we're also using it to generate conversation for future planning purposes to ensure that we can uh, achieve the agenda set forth by our um, Excellence and Equity Initiative. So we're going to, in the next three slides, go over the key recommendations that were generated by our um, Superintendent's Advisory Committee, in which they analyzed all of the 4,000 plus responses through our Thought Exchange Survey, and also brought their own level of expertise to the conversation to present to the board some of, I some of these ideas for consideration, both for the immediate term as we develop the LCAP, but also for future planning purposes as well. And before I dig deeply into each of these themes and, and sections and so forth, I wanted to um, provide a couple of different frameworks by which to process this information. The first is that, as uh, Dr. Salazar alluded to, there were three major themes that came out loudly and clearly from stakeholders during this process. The idea of thinking about academic supports and learning recovery to address and mitigate learning loss, uh, a holistic intervention and enrichment plan for our students to get the educational experience that they need. The second is social emotional learning and the importance of meeting the moment right now at a time of isolation for the school system to think about relationships and connection and mental health and a holistic way of addressing the whole child. The third is student engagement and motivation. The idea that uh, once our students are uh, with us, either in person or in a, in, in a Zoom class, we want to ensure that they are connecting and being able to apply their learning uh, within, within their own lives. This gets to conversations around um, whether they see reflected in what they're learning their own cultural experiences. And that conversation that we had yesterday uh, about, about equity and, and, and about, the, um, about that, that, that profound sense of connection with one's history, right? So that, that's one framework. Um, the, the second is this, this framework of multiple ways of, of viewing and understanding some of these concepts. So for example, connection, right? Uh, you're gonna see that theme running throughout um, these recommendations and they can be interpreted in many different ways and in fact they are interpreted in many different ways by stakeholders when we engage it in further discussion with them. One is to think about like how are they connecting, literally connecting right now to their teachers in, in a virtual um, educational experience and the idea of needing uh, the appropriate technology to be able to engage. But there's also a connection related to feeling connected as part of a school community. And how do, we, how do we accomplish that in a virtual setting? And how do we accomplish that as we pivot back to reopening schools? That's a theme that, that was very evident when, um, when we, we heard and saw the Renaissance presentation yesterday. The, the third form of con connectivity or connection is one around culture, right? One around uh, really ensuring that the lived experiences of our students and our families are reflected in the experiences that they have with us in our schools. Uh, and you'll see that um, very palpably in all of these different recommendations in, in their own way. So I wanted to make sure I call that out to, um, to set up a stage for this conversation. Dr. Benitez? Yeah, uh, thank you, Robert. Just a quick uh, clarification question in terms of process. Are, are all of the um, recommendations from slides five through eight or pages five through eight drawn from either uh, directly or implicitly the LCAP? Yes, okay. in some way, shape or form. And so um, it was certainly used to develop our, our learning continuity plan in the fall, which set the stage for this year. But it is also going to be a pivot point for us as we develop the LCAP for next school year and beyond. And, and it was intentional in that regard, Dr. Benitez, because we, we wanted to honor the, the stakeholder feedback. And, and they're saying that a lot of these recommendations, as, as um, Board Member Kerr alluded to, 
they've been they've been expressed in many different forms for many different years and so so now we want to really activate upon that both in the near term as well as in in future years so so details on these recommendations right these are academic support recommendations you'll see the theme on the left column and some of the details in terms of specific recommendations on the right and as far as themes are concerned you'll see references to technology, references to clear assignments and expectations, professional development, and interactive personal instruction and structure. And I'll, I'll, I'll highlight a couple of points here because I think they're critical. The technology piece has been evident for us for, for, for quite some time now, so I won't belabor that point. But in terms of the clarity of assignments and expectations, um, that really stems from the idea that it's vitally important for our teachers and our schools to communicate clearly with our students and their families what their homework is, how it should be done, how it should be turned in, what does it mean if I'm, you know, what, what, what are the expectations when it's asynchronous. And it gets to the root of goal five in the strategic plan, which is communication for the district. Right? So I wanted to make sure I highlight that because there's, that is the very practical manifestation of that goal for our, many of our families. Professional development um, is, a, a we have a robust program for professional development. Yesterday you saw a presentation from OCIPD that really addressed many of the considerations that are already presented here. But a lot of it now is thinking about how do we ensure that our teachers are skilled in engaging students in many different forms, whether it's virtual or in person, whether it's uh, ensuring that it's rooted in the, the lived experiences and cultural heritage of our students. How do we ensure that our, our teachers and our, our administrators are equipped um, for that challenge? And then in terms of interactive and personalized instruction and, um, instruction and structure, many different manifestations, you know, small, Class size is something that you see running as a theme, but it isn't simply like uh, the ratio of students to teachers. They're also thinking about if you're in a Zoom uh, class, how do we use small groups or breakout rooms in effective ways to ensure that students can engage in smaller settings so that they get the personal attention that they need. As it relates to social emotional learning, the themes here include uh, counseling and mental health services. There is a reason why um, this particular recommendation is the longest because this has been identified as an absolutely critical need, right? And it, it comes in many different forms. It comes in the form of just the um, basic level of engagement with schools to ensure that we're thinking about the whole child and using that framework, but also to, to various degrees of intensity um, as, as it gets to understanding the trauma that many of our communities are experiencing now. And the multiple ways that the school system can um, address that need both directly, um, you know, through our school staff, through our family resource centers, but also through partnerships with our school-based mental health collaborative and, and other partners. You'll see again, toward the bottom of, of this slide, a, a reference to uh, relationships and connections. That's another really critical point um, that um, the stakeholders want uh, the board and, and our district leaders to, to continue to remember. And then lastly here with student motivation and engagement, again, similar themes, right? The class size issue, professional development, but let me draw your attention to the middle, um, toward the bottom, the second to last row, where it, it mentions meaningful and engaging learning, right? You'll note there, there are four bullet points. One is like evaluating how we give assignments. We need to find a way to make assignments meaningful and show students how they are directly related to the subject. Many students don't feel motivated to do or complete work engaging activities that extend beyond screen time. Some of these have budget ramifications naturally, but some are also more around the operational realm. Some, it's the way that we do it. 
that, that stakeholders are wanting us to consider, uh, even if our limited resources uh, present some challenges for us in terms of increasing funding. But that second bullet point really gets to the issue of equity and, and um, all of the themes that have already been discussed by the board. The idea of students really wanting to feel connected to what they're learning in their classroom, right? How do we ensure that we capture the lived experiences of our students and address their needs in, in class so that they can remain engaged? So that's, um, that's the framework by which we've received um, these recommendations. And in the ensuing slides for the remainder of this presentation, we're gonna talk about some of the immediate ways that the district has already begun to address these recommendations. And then um, Renee will, will talk about that in this next slide. And then I'll close by talking about just the process for the LCAP and how we're going to utilize these recommendations as a, as a jumping off point for, for that planning process. Good morning, everybody. Happy to be here today, and this is my opportunity to provide some high-level snapshots of the actions that we've already taken as a district. We're in the unique position this year in that we have been provided additional resources through federal funding um, through the CARES Act to support several of these activities for district and student needs. Let's talk first about technology and the support that we've provided thus far. LBSD has provided reliable technology access for all teachers and students, including distributions of hotspots and over 30,000 Chromebooks to our students of LBSD. The schools have opened their doors. They've offered technical support for a variety of challenges to the families. They've taken the support via phone calls or by establishing office hours for in-person support or making appointments to address our families' needs. Our LBSD Technology Help Center has been here along the way to assist all of our staff with their technology needs. And in addition, the learning management system, known as Canvas, has been implemented and supported via the professional development process, which I'd like to talk a little bit about. Our professional development process is an ongoing year-long process, but in August, during our teacher training week, we had several, several uh, trainings on Smart Starts, Canvas, EL supports. Continuing September through even as recent as February, we had trainings in areas such as lesson design, content area supports, increased student engagement, and many, many others. We are continuing with opportunities for self-paced learning supports and site-based, site-led learning opportunities to support at our site levels. In the area of health and safety, all of our indoor spaces are equipped with air filtration systems that meet the minimum requirements set by guidance for reopening schools from the California Department of Public Health. Our purchases have been made for LBSD to use antimicrobial technology as added layer of protection for surfaces within a classroom. In addition, PPE for sites and offices such as hand sanitizers, masks, gloves, health screening devices to support arrival on campuses and offices, and the removal of non-essential classroom furniture for physically distanced classrooms are just some of the areas that we've been supporting our school sites and offices in operating during this time. One of the greatest benefits of this is that some of those items were provided through the state of California and through local donations from our community right here in Long Beach, and we are so grateful for those donations. Let's move on to our interventions that we've already implemented. Many sites across our district are offering school tutoring, after school, and on Saturday schools. The district is deep, deep in planning. We've developed a committee that is deep in planning for our 2021 summer session for our learning acceleration for our students. On February 17th, we brought to this board master agreements with six supplemental tutoring service companies. These agreements, which go through 2122, are going to support over 9,000 hours of tutoring support for our students, and we, ad, we are estimating about 31,000 total participants. The beauty of this is although they cover the entire district, schools with greater numbers of highest need students have received more resources. 
because of these contracts. Speaking of students receiving resources, the Nutrition Services Branch is a huge, huge supporter of our students. Our sites provided opportunities for students to receive grab-and-go lunches throughout the year, and we will continue once we return to school campuses. Modifications were made to our ever-evolving program to provide more meals, including supper and snacks, and to provide a schedule where multiple meals could be picked up at once in support of nu student nutrition and family schedules. And finally, last but not least, the topic of social emotional support. Our family resource centers continue to be a strong component of our LBSD support for students and families and serve the emotional and behavioral needs of students and families at 26 designated sites throughout LBSD. Our principals and counselors are regularly providing teachers with uh, resources to support personal wellness and self-care. Our site counselors across all levels use a variety of ways to connect with students, including Canvas pages, check in with students, making announcements, and sharing resources. When possible, they are even holding virtual social gatherings to engage the students outside of instructional time. Many of these supports and suggested um, gathered through our budget engagement process were already tightly aligned with our district planning. Our staff have, have already had items on order starting as early as March of 2020. Items such as technology and health and safety purchases were being made right away. In conjunction, we have another factor to highlight here. Not everything I mentioned required monetary support. As Yumi mentioned earlier, we're looking at a structural deficit, but we do have the support of our CARES Act funding. So the beauty of the budget engagement process, while centered around the budget and what we can do with it, is that the suggestions offered and requested by our communities didn't always require monetary support. They required our already exceptional staff and management to implement some ideas and develop plans to support our students and staff. The budget engagement process is really an opportunity to launch and develop many ideas that will support our students, especially as we're about to see in the learning and continuity plan process that Robert's gonna go over next. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Robert so we can close out our presentation with some more information about where we will see these supports. So you've had a chance to um, see the work that stakeholders have uh, provided to the district and also how it's already begun to be incorporated into both um, the plans for this year, plans for school reopening, and, and, and actions taken during um, distance learning. Now I'd like to pivot to uh, future thinking about how we're leveraging these recommendations from stakeholders and using it for our planning processes moving forward. Uh, and this gets to some of the, the questions that Dr. Benitez asked uh, earlier today. Uh, the LCAP, I think it's, it's really critical to um, establish what it is for, for the board uh, and, and for the community at large, right? The LCAP's a three-year plan that describes the goals, actions, services, and expenditures to support positive student outcomes. It is a required California document that is in conjunction and intricately connected with the district's budget. Indeed, we can't pass uh, and approve a budget without also approving the LCAP. And you'll see that when we talk about the timeline later on. So those two are always intricately, intricately connected. And to the degree that we are engaging in a budget engagement process, we are also, by definition, engaging in an LCAP process. Um, the one other thing to point out about the LCAP, and it's in the last clause of that first bullet point, is that the, the support for positive student outcomes is specifically intended to highlight the need of low-income students, English learners, and foster youth. In the LCAP jargon, you will often hear it referred to as unduplicated pupils, which in many respects is a rather unfortunate term. But all of which is to say that these are our students with the highest needs, and the state of California defines it as, are you a low-income student? Are you an English learner and are you a foster youth, right? 
So there are some very critical actions that the district takes in order to support students who have, um, who have these demographic backgrounds. The LCAP process requires both stakeholder engagement and alignment with the, the district budget. So all of the recommendations that we received around academic support, social emotional learning, and student engagement and motivation are gonna be the foundation for what the board sees in the, in the LCAP. So I'm gonna draw your attention back to this timeline, right? We've seen this, um, this work, this body of work stretching from you know, last year around this time through um, the first part of this spring semester. For the remainder of the school year, what you're going to see is LCAP engagement leveraging the work that we had done with the budget engagement process, culminating in an adopted LCAP and budget in June. So what's gonna happen between now and then? Here's our general timeline. Right now we're, um, we're in the midst of reviewing stakeholder data and recommendations with the public, so that's what this presentation represents. We're continuing to gather feedback from stakeholders, including from most recently the District Community Advisory Committee, or DCAC, and our District English Learner Advisory Committee, DLAC. We basically gave them the same presentation that you're getting now, so all stakeholders are on the same page. And they've given us a reinforcement of the recommendations that's, that, that's already been laid out, right? And in fact, a few of the items that they highlighted are part of the agenda for the remainder of the board workshop, including language access. Right? So that's a preview of, the, of the, the last presentation you're gonna get today. In mid-April, on April 15, the district is gonna release the initial draft of the LCAP as we have information for it. Um, that preliminary draft of the LCAP uh, is um, going to be posted on lbschools.net in English, Spanish, and Khmer, And you will see enshrined in it these recommendations. You will also see in it a description of our stakeholder engagement process and some of the initial thinking around what next school year looks like. Immediately thereafter, you're going to uh, see that there's a community forum which we're organizing right now with community partners um, to try to gather additional feedback on the specific draft that we produce in, in uh, mid-April. So that event will occur on April 29 so that from that forum, additional ideas that we will incorporate into the LCAP during the month of May. At that time, the state will release um, you know, budget and may revise numbers that will then help to fully develop the fiscal end of the LCAP, culminating in a public hearing during the first um, board meeting in June, and then presenting the final LCAP for adoption by the board at the last meeting of the school year. This will enable our school system to meet um, the education code requirement to have an approved LCAP and budget by June 30 of, of, the, of 2021. At this time, um, the, the team and I would like to turn it over to, um, to the board for any questions or remarks or feedback for us. Um, but I'd like to pause on behalf of the team to thank um, the leadership of our school system for continuing to uplift uh, the voices of our stakeholders um, as we go through a, a budget engagement process that has for us uh, really produced some really fruitful ideas. You know, it's, it's, it's not lost on us that when we talk about budgets, we, we're naturally drawn to think about numbers. But like Renee was alluding to and, and Dr. Salazar mentioned, you know, this is really about the values of the school system and about the lived experiences of our students. So everything that we capture or attempt to capture in these documents, we're really thinking about the needs of our kids. So with that, I wanna turn it over to you and, and, and thank you again for continuing to support our efforts. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate the presentation. And um, Robert, I'm glad you mentioned that we are accustomed to seeing numbers when we're talking about the budget, but that um, this presentation reflects the values of the district. So I appreciate you saying that. 
Um, Mr. Miller, I think you had a, uh, a Yeah, just a, a quick question or comment. First off, thank you again for putting this together and really looking at the principles of our budget and not getting so caught up in the numbers. But I did have more of a uh, comment more than a, a question here. So I was thinking about the actions taken slide that we saw, which was fantastic uh, in regards to quantifying the uh, impacts that the LCAPs had to our district. But the one thing that I thought would be helpful, because you did say a statement that I thought was definitely uh, true to at least what I've experienced, uh, which was some of the uh, activities that were listed as actions weren't necessarily uh, required some uh, fiscal uh, impacts. Uh, so I think that regardless, if it did or did not have a uh, uh, fiscal impact, I think that it's still good for us to quantify those things because at least from a community standpoint, it helps us understand the reconciliation of the LCAP funding. So uh, essentially what I would suggest when it comes to the larger community presentation, that there is this juxtaposition of the themes that we have or the actions that were taken along with the potential cost that they would be, even if they did or did not require any fiscal impact, to show the reconciliation saying, for example, it would have really cost us $30 million to do this component, but we only spent 20, or we were allotted 26. So that's more of a suggestion than it was a uh, question, I, I, as I just think that it would be good for the community uh, to have that, like I said earlier, form of rec reconciliation in their minds. Dr. Benitez. Yeah, just to build on that, uh, Mr. Miller, um, I guess our, our, our thinking waves got crossed uh, here. So I, I think we, we have um, rightly so emphasized the importance of coherence in Dr. Baker's uh, work. Um, and, and I think this is also a good opportunity for our board to talk about alignment with uh, recommendations and actions to some of the board um, work that we've been focusing on, namely our communications audit, um, our community engagement conversations, and then uh, most recently our uh, work around board development with AJ, uh, right? And our um, affirmation of wanting to be more intentional in our student outcomes focus. So, so here's what I would suggest, and again, it's building on, on, on what you just shared, Eric. A, a big part of the community engagement stakeholder meetings, as all of you know, and, and as uh, board member Kerr alluded to, that these things have been, we've been hearing about many of these things for many years, uh, I think has to do with, one, how we communicate um, where and how we've taken these recommendations as they are reflected both in terms of action, budget, but I think the piece that, that um, I wanna highlight is outcomes. So here was a recommendation, here's the action that we took, and then again, considering budget, any budget considerations and implications, here's how it aligns with our student success uh, priorities, whether they be the equity gaps, okay, so how, how did this impact um, the data uh, that was shared yesterday, uh, for example? So, Here's what, what I would suggest. Again, in the spirit of communication and transparency, um, in these presentations, it would be super helpful to include both two, two, two items that, that are already there. Here's the item, here's the recommendation, here's the action. W what I would suggest is as part of the action, um, the budget piece is important, but also where the alignment is, and it goes back to the importance of coherence, with our um, student success measures, whether that be GPA or attendance or A through G completion, uh, because that's the data that was presented uh, to us and that's what we say we wanna do, right? Be more student outcomes focused so that there's both a, a consistency, but that in some regards, there's a paper trail. You recommended it, we did it. Uh, here's where it's reflected in terms of our, our measures. And if we need to tweak our measures, you know, I brought that up yesterday, if we need to look at other things beyond GPA. Uh, and um, here are the outcomes in, with respect to our equity gaps. Uh, I, I think if we um, 
obviously this is not a one meeting to the next, but I think if we get that as a standard, like anytime we get an update that it's, here was, here, here, here's where it was in terms of a recommendation and whether it was a longstanding recommendation or a pivot as you suggested, uh, Robert, I like that. Uh, what we're doing in terms of action with a budget uh, consideration, um, how they align with our student success priorities. And we can take the framework of, of high school readiness if that's what we you know, uh, agree to, but you know, whether it's GPA or whatever, or attendance uh, in this regard. And then ultimately, the outcome for us to then have robust conversations about is, you know, is this putting a dent in our equity gaps conversation? Is this lowering the number of D's and F's that our students uh, are receiving? Is this increasing our attendance? Uh, is this having an impact on our high school readiness measures? I think that would be super helpful for me. I think it would be super helpful for community. And as much as they've asked us to be more transparent and asked us where is this showing up in the budget uh, and or try, try to also hold us accountable, are we really doing this stuff? And if so, how is it impacting our outcomes? So that, that would be my uh, thought uh, in terms of how the information is presented to us. Thank you, uh, Ms. Kerr. Yeah, just to continue on what Dr. Benitez was saying, I think this plays into the work that we're doing in board development is because we don't have really specific goals and they're not written um, as SMART goals, which are strategic and measurable and starting point, ending point, and all of those around specific areas with interim goals that we can follow up on. We don't have the opportunity to measure anything. We know that good work is happening. We have a whole list of, of great work that is happening. So um, I agree that as we do our work, really giving clear goals for what the vision and value of our community is, which is what we're talking about in our budget, so that the Dr. Baker and her team can then meet those goals in measurable ways. So when we have presentations like that, we can pinpoint this is where it went, because this is what we said was important. So I wholeheartedly agree. Um, I appreciate that, I appreciate all of the work, and I really appreciate that Renee is part of the conversation about what our values are and not just an interim budget, even though she does that spectacularly, um, that she does the numbers well, but this is that integration piece of seeing that our budget department isn't working on the third floor doing their own thing, that they're really integrated into the work around the goals that we have for students. So it is great to see you up there in that capacity. I do have a numbers question if I'm allowed to ask, um, because we are going into this process of an LCAP we know that there is state funding that we have used up in terms of the first allocation of CARES dollars, but we also know that as of last week, there are more dollars coming that again are one-time dollars. So my question is a technical question that we don't necessarily need to get into the answer today, but do those dollars have a spend-by date the way that our previous dollars did? So how are we looking at that one-time influx of funding What's the spend by date and how do we incorporate that into the LCAP that is a three-year plan? Because we're gonna want to, I assume, I have a whole list of individual things I'd love to suggest, um, but we're gonna wanna create systems and supports for students that will get funded by dollars that are one-time dollars. So how are we being strategic in creating programs that support students that the funding is going to go away and that we're not creating a system that is now dependent on dollars we don't have. So I would hope that as we're engaging with the community around LCAP, as we are excited to provide robust supports for student learning starting immediately and this summer, doing that with the understanding of one-time dollars and they have to be spent by. And I'm not clear on the spend by date. I don't necessarily need it today, but I just wanted to remind us as they're probably not the same. It's not a spend it in three years and the LCAP is a three-year plan. So as we plan out what that system looks like over the next three years, being cognizant of, of when the dollars will no longer be there and what programs do we then integrate into our budget, but then we know something else goes away at that point. So I just, for the context of um, as we enter the process, being really cognizant of how those dollars work in comparison to the timelines for planning. So we can, we can certainly prepare something that reflects the spend by dates because with the relief money, all of it has a spend by date. 
And I think something significant that Renee um, talked about was this thinking around priorities and sustainability. And so rather than just thinking about this as a one-time influx, um, we have been doing an analysis of current programs that are funded in, uh, with LCFF and with other funds to ask the question, what has been the measurable outcome of these programs and should they be continued? And as Renee talked about sustainability, that there are some things that we want to do high treatment dose immediately, but other things that we'll need to think about, do, are they programs that we're starting now that we want to live long in Long Beach Unified School District, which also may mean that something else doesn't continue. And so, I mean, you, you've pinned the complexity of it, Ms. Kerr, in terms of the short term and the long term, um, and, and we'll be working at both. And there will be, this is just a kind of an overview of, of what the work will be all spring and into the months of summer. Um, with a lot of engagement opportunities and a lot of discussion left to happen. Uh, Mr. Otto. I, I mentioned this once before in a previous board meeting, um, uh, and, I, and I've been trying to figure out whether the way that I'm getting this stuff is, uh, is different because I'm new, and so there's so much to, to learn that it's, uh, you know, I go, I, I find myself saying to myself 50 times in these meetings, oh, I didn't know that. Uh, oh, I didn't know it worked that way. And, uh, but <clears throat> but when, I, when I get these, these documents, you know, these documents, 50 page documents um, right before the presentation. All I can do is try and keep up with the presentation and make sure I understand it. Now, maybe a year from now, uh, that won't, uh, you know, it, it, it will be different. But still, the way that I learned, and I've known this for a long, long time, is that if I have it ahead of time and I can look at it, and I can kind of formulate questions, and I do, I read it all uh, when I have it, uh, that then I'm not only trying to keep up, but I'm also responding and trying to figure out. And so the learning, at least my learning, is deeper uh, in terms of understanding <clears throat> what the process is. And I didn't, I, I wasn't thinking about that. I mean, I've been busy trying to keep up with all this stuff. But I spent about two hours last night on something that I had asked for last uh, February about the uh, school plans for uh, student achievement. We get them, we're asked to approve them, uh, but I never saw one. It was just, it's this school, it's this school. And um, so I asked for one just so I could get an example of it. And so they, they sent me one for, for a school and I was able to, look at the accountability measures and literally put them up on the wall uh, so I could, because if you're just flipping pages, it's kind of like, did I, what, do I know that one or I do that one? Uh, and I thought, well, maybe I just have to do that and, and this idea of getting things ahead of time isn't as important as it's just being here for a long time. But I think not, I think that I, and I, and I've, I've tried to figure out the logistics of trying to get this information to us early and what it would cost and you know, what it would entail in terms of staff time and all that. But um, I know there, there are literally, uh, I come from a, a, a community college perspective where we, you know, I, so I know how they do things. And there are schools that actually give these kinds of things out a couple weeks in advance. And, uh, that seems like an enormous amount of time. Uh, but, um, but if I had materials that I could work with and then uh, ask questions of staff uh, ahead of time with the direction of the superintendent, I feel like uh, the learning curve would be still very vertical, but it would be deeper, if that makes any sense. And uh, so um, I... Uh, I, I understood, I under, I'm very interested in, in budget stuff and, uh, and how it works and, 
And by the way, I, I think it's ridiculous this year because, uh, you know, in January, I believed that we were not gonna have any money at all. And now I, I feel like there are billions of dollars that are coming our way uh, from the federal government and the state government. And we're not sure how to use that and it's changing all the time. And, you know, I, I, I read a, a report uh, very early this morning or an opinion piece by a former superintendent from this district that said, uh, you know, we ought to do this statewide. We shouldn't just do it locally. That uh, there's a way to reasons to do it that way. And I'm kind of going, uh, you know, how do how do you how how do you get uh, a good idea about it? There, there's so much uh, uh, information and opinion going on that I'm just trying to figure out a way to get my my mind around it. But I do, and, and but I I really have come to the conclusion that for me personally and. It may be because I'm new uh, that it would be very helpful to have um, some of the printed information just a little bit ahead of time so that I can learn faster. So that's, that's just my point. Um, well, Mr. Otto, I think that is um, a good suggestion. If uh, staff could make reports available to board members maybe electronically, maybe, you know, send an email. I'm sure everybody already has it. Um, and then if they could send it along, we could read ahead of time. I think that's a, a, a great suggestion. Uh, when you talk about everything being new and, and, and thinking, oh, I didn't know that or I didn't know that. Let me tell you, I've been on this board a long time and there's always new information. There's always something new to learn, which is one of the things I love about serving on the board is that nothing is static and it's, it's ever changing. And especially after a day like yesterday when we're hearing about all the wonderful things we're doing, uh, the work that we're doing through an equity lens, everything, it's, it's always changing. There's always something to learn. So don't feel that just because you're new, you're, you're learning everything, I feel that we're constantly learning, and it's it's a it's a great group to be a part of, um, and and you see the talent and expertise that goes into everything. Um, Mrs. Craighead, may may I also yes. add? Um, maybe I was remiss also in the opening yesterday or today, um, but the purpose of board workshop is actually for this learning experience. And so feel, and point well taken, Mr. Otto, about wanting things ahead of time. You're a real consumer of, of information and want to be prepared, and I highly respect that. And the reason why there's no action taken at a board workshop is that it is really for the opportunity to immerse in learning. And so thinking about um, yesterday around academics and student data and then the business that supports all of that, um, feel comfortable in knowing these are not one-time experiences and they are really by design for opportunity for discussion and learning. But, I, but I've got a note about your interests, so thanks. I think, we're, I think we should probably close the item because we're behind schedule. I'm just gonna <laughs> request that we thank, thank the team that has been here. Thank you very much, Lucy and Renee and Robert and Yumi for your very good work and for the beginning of a lot more information about budget engagement and processes. We appreciate you. Thank you. So now we will go to the facilities update. Sure, I'll introduce the item as David Miranda, Executive Director of Facilities Development and Planning, and Alan Rising, our business services administrator, as they make their way up here. So today we'll pre be providing an update on our bond program, our Measure E, Measure e and Measure K, K um, bond programs, which will, in essence, touch every, almost every school, every corner of the school district to bring modernized facilities that meet the educational needs of our students. Um, we'll also go through our master planning process um, what are our remaining needs in the school district, and really as a launch point to what would a future facilities um, program look like, and as well as a dis discussion on taking advantage of, of, of leveraging some of our surplus properties 
to better meet the needs of our communities um, in the form of our district headquarters. So I will turn it over to uh, Mr. Miranda at this point. Thank you, Yumi. Good morning, members of the board, Superintendent Baker, executive staff, and our members of the audience. And really thank you for the opportunity to, uh, uh, for you carving out some time on our agenda to speak to our facilities items. There's quite a bit, uh, yet I feel we'll be able to move at quite a healthy pace here as well. Uh, Co-presenting with me this morning is a familiar face, Mr. Alan Rising, our business service administrator. He'll be speaking specifically to our asset management and surplus properties. So our three-part agenda, which Yumi outlined, so I appreciate that as well. Um, I'll be covering the first two sections, which are project updates, program updates, and facility master plan segments. Uh, again, I feel we'll move at a healthy pace. I figured at that point in time I could stop for questions and answers before we officially transition into the asset management section. Feels appropriate to probably break at that point. Uh, there's quite a bit of ground to cover, as Yumi described as well. Um, and this is a familiar format, right? So we're really sticking to that theme in terms of highlighting recently completed work, projects that have shovels in the ground to date, uh, and projects that are coming down the immediate pipeline. Uh, when I was presenting to the board previously as part of our facilities update, we highlighted projects that we were closing off as part of phase four of our program before transitioning into phase five. Uh, so those were schools like Mirror, Bigsby, Naples, Alvarado. Um, those are doing fine, officially in the closeout stages and, and ready for instruction, of course. Um, and now we're transitioned. We're currently in the ground into phase five and in the planning stage for phase six. With respect to the master plan, um, the last time we addressed this item with the board was roughly one year ago. So it does feel like a good point in time. Uh, COVID slowed down a bit of those efforts and I'll speak more deeply into those efforts as well as we go along. And then asset management. We, um, I was last in front of the board in October uh, where the board gave us authority and direction to circle back with a recommendation. So our focus um, as part of this presentation will really be to provide a bit of background information, uh, speak to the activities we've embarked on since then, and then of course finish off with a recommendation. Our project update. So I very much feel like the proud parent during this segment, right? So um, our team of facility staff, partners in the construction industry and consulting firms that help us as part of this massive building program, um, really have done a great job. And more so during this period of time where it's been an unfortunate circumstance of events, yet in our world, we've been able to accelerate construction quite a bit. And I'll speak to some, some of those in detail as we go, go through the presentation. But here you see some pictures, right? So I really hope that this presentation or this part of the presentation in particular is more of a show and tell. Um, really wish and maybe if there was more time, I would have plugged in even more photos because there's quite a bit to show. Um, I will tell you guys that the pictures, even though they look great, do not give it justice, right? So there's projects highlighted here, some pictured, some not, but all of them uh, are just in great shape. So with respect to Hughes power upgrade, this was a segment of the project with Measure E in anticipation of their HVAC project that's about to start up really right about now, um, where we just got a head start. So we figure where we're gonna embark on a power upgrade um, to really make sure we have the appropriate capacity and an electrical needs for the site. We do so sometimes on the front of the end of the project, sometimes on the back end. With respect to Hughes, we got a head start on that one and, and it was very successful. Uh, Longfellow was really a, a unique project. We, we de-scoped part of that building or part of that project from roughly one year prior. And we really just circled back to that part of the project and that component to finish things off. Um, bid the project, um, got good pricing in terms of the work that we embarked on and that is now complete and open. Uh, the pictures you see there are Jordan High School, uh, library to the left, auditorium to the right. Uh, again, unique buildings, modern state-of-the-art facilities for Jordan High School and their staff and community. Uh, they really look great. I'd highly advise folks go out there and take a peek because they just look incredible. So, of course, with the library, um, really shifting and transitioning into the space it should be today, right? Not so much in terms of book stacks and books within the space, rather gathering spaces for small group, large group, conference and meeting needs. Uh, there's technology updates, of course, modern state-of-the-art furniture, which makes a huge difference as well. And then on the auditorium side, uh, you know, our typical HVAC scope, really addressing seismic needs on, as part of the building and the project, but also addressing things like lighting and flooring, uh, seating, the, state, the, the curtain for the stage, um, 
and of course a state of the art really modern sound system and that's one that's really um, it, again it just doesn't give it justice until you go into that building and listen to it as well uh, when I was last in front of the board we highlighted Millikan's new two-story classroom building as being recently opened and complete this morning I'll highlight the Millikan track and field project uh, again pictured down below to the left um, synthetic track and field surface nine lane track uh, drainage um, water cool down system as part of the project as well. There's still a few finishing touches for us out there. We're currently working on um, really a paint project and cosmetic type projects in the, in the grandstand, the bleacher area. Figured we do not want to walk away from this project unless we really tidy things up a bit further and finish that off. And then of course Stevenson Elementary, we've highlighted this project before, um, some repairs um, as a result of, of fire damage out there. So that project is now complete as well. Uh, this pro actually, this slide came out a little bit choppy, but I'll, I'll really paint the picture for you as well, and, and you'll see it much more clearly in the handout. Um, really meant to be a snapshot in time with respect to where we are on active projects, and just to get you oriented, project listed on the left, um, buildings by building number or phase that are complete in the next immediate column, um, project that's currently, or work that's currently taking place, and then finishing off with work that's coming down the pipeline for each of those projects. Uh, really what this reflects is, in particular with um, the completed work, it, it really starts to reflect and show and demonstrate how much we were able to accelerate. So often with building programs our size and taking on so many projects at any given time, we end up in this big race, right, where we're just wrapping things up, we're tidying things up at the very tail end of the summer, I don't feel we're gonna be faced with that this year. Um, in many cases, we're gonna wrap up projects such as Cubberly in late April. Um, some of these other building projects that are just identified by phase or building will wrap up in May and June and July respectively as well. That really bodes well for things we do at the tail end of projects such as final cleanup and of course our move in phase. Um, really critical, right, that we finish things off and, and really take things across that goal line. And because we've been able to accelerate, we'll be able to do so. Um, not, not pictured up here on the slide, but Lakewood Field shows up as uh, being in the demolition phase. Uh, of course, just breaking ground out there, getting things started, but it's the next project in line for synthetic track and turf field. A few pictures up here, just, just to get folks oriented. Um, you see the school name down below and, and some construction activities. I, I've been reminded, you know, David, the, the pictures of duct work are not all that exciting. Um, yet we feel remi really remiss to not show that, right? Because that's a big focus of the Measure E bond program in terms of adding HVAC to uh, all the aging campuses and campuses that did not have air conditioning and heating systems. Uh, so there you see Coverly up top pictured at the left. Uh, if we go clockwise to the right, we see Prisk, uh, again, really going at a good steady pace. Um, we hit a big milestone recently and it really helped us on the academic side as we're shifting gears and going to in-person instruction uh, fairly soon, uh, we had a situation where the original construction schedule, schedule would have resulted in multiple moves for certain teachers, right? We would have moved into a certain building, finished off that respective phase or building, and had to move them again. Uh, but the contractors and our team did a great job to accelerate construction again and make sure that double move did not occur. Uh, so we're really proud of those efforts over at Prisk. And then Madison, you see pictured, uh, started a little later than some of the other projects listed on this slide, yet going at a very healthy and good pace as well. So there you see a, a, just a, a sample classroom down below. You see some of the flooring that took place, natural light, um, window coverings of course are part of the project in addition to lighting. Uh, you see a sink pictured there, accessible sink, um, and, and a wet space, right? A, a, a wet area kind of carved out down below. And, and then, Actually, I'm gonna transition into the next picture, next set of pictures. Um, and I'll start with Fremont up top just to continue with those efforts in terms of what a typical classroom looks like post-construction. Uh, because here you see some of those same elements in terms of carpet and lighting and ceilings and, and, and window treatments. Uh, but you also see the technology updates pictured, right? So in terms of the, the projector, the screen, uh, these are all components of our Measure E bond improvements across the board. I'm gonna to continue to go clockwise and go to Wilson High School. There you see another picture. Um, Wilson, very unique, very different project, older campus. Um, so of course, every so often we encounter a surprise or an unforeseen condition on that one. Uh, but the team has done a great job of being responsive and learning along the way as well. So 
where perhaps phase one uh, of that project went a little slower uh, than, than anticipated, we feel we're gonna pick up on those efforts and we've already been improving upon those efforts along the way and each respective phase that follows is going a little bit faster. So again, we're proud of those efforts over at Wilson High School. And then Lakewood High School, ju just a picture. Uh, this was basically on day one or two of the project. So you see the heavy equipment out there, the demo work that takes place. Um, it will look significantly different uh, really every week, right? So if, as we drive by that project and that building or that campus, you'll see a bunch of those efforts and it'll go f relatively fast. Uh, the project just broke ground, uh, scheduled to complete this summer. So we'll have a turnover for the school in the fall. Projects that are coming down the pipeline, um, quite a few. So I mentioned earlier tran the transition from phase five into phase six of our building program, and that's really what you see pictured here for the most part. Um, Bryant, Twain, and Hughes, all projects that have been earmarked to occur during phase six. Um, Robinson K-8 school uh, was originally scheduled to take place last year. We pushed that one to this year. Uh, but had a re uh, very, very much a ready, willing, and able contractor who hung on to that bid. Uh, so they're gonna, ready to embark on that project as well. Of course, we'll have the continuation of our efforts at Wilson High School um, and really a large endeavor and large project over at Jordan. So uh, again, when I was last in front of the board, we highlighted what phase two, uh, to be in particular will look like. New two-story classroom building, um, housing quite a few different programs in addition to special ed uh, classrooms new courtyard, courtyard, lunch shelter, infrastructure, uh, quite a unique project to finish off that end of the campus. Uh, the project is gonna be the first under our community workforce development agreement. So we're starting to engage in those dialogues and efforts with our trade union folks and count, council and partners, uh, just to make sure we're geared up and those bid documents are, are set up accordingly. Uh, and then site improvements. Electronic door locks is one I wanted to highlight briefly. So in our continued effort, to make schools and campuses safe for our staff and students, uh, this really just feels like the next logical project, right? We've addressed um, site fencing and perimeter fencing across the board at every campus. We've embarked on projects where we identify a single point of entry to every campus and, and, and install electronic visitor screening system. Uh, electronic door locks felt like the next logical, wo logical one for us, but we really wanted to start with a pilot. So we identified four schools plus support facilities, um, which, it, for the most part becomes school safety. Uh, we're really proud of this project to date just in the planning stages because it's been super collaborative uh, in working with our school safety partners, the TISB division, the maintenance division, and that will continue all the way through because there's different training components and responsibilities that will follow that project as well. Uh, we know that the system in and of itself is not the end all be all, right? It, it will achieve um, improvements in terms of site access control will help alleviate concerns that center around keys and lost keys, right? And that liability as well. But for the most part, it's gonna change behaviors, right? Because folks, instead of using a key to access their room or a building, will actually use their district ID badge. So that ID, ba ID badge will not be programmed to serve as a key. Um, and we know and we've learned and we've heard from many folks in other districts that that's probably the, the ultimate deterrent, right? So in terms of um, potential threats on campus making sure that we know who's on a campus and that they belong and that they have a, an appropriate ID badge is the ultimate deterrent. So we're really proud of that effort as well. Um, this slide is really meant to be uh, more of a heads up. So this was an improvement we I embarked on and included as part of our LB School Bonds webpage recently. And it really breaks up our district boundary and our projects by board member region. So for any of you, if you wanted to go in there and take a quick peek, and just look at your specific region. It really gives you a snapshot in time of projects that are complete, in progress, or planned um, across any campus in your region. Uh, our COC committee really enjoyed this effort. We've been trying to highlight it a bit more and more. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that, uh, that you guys were in tune with that part of the webpage as well. And then slightly shifting gears to our master plan. Um, so again, what is a master plan? We, we've touched on this in the past, but it has been a good chunk of time. But in a sense, it's a roadmap, right? It, it's what are we gonna do? What do we need to do? Where do we need to do it? How much will it cost? Um, and, and what does that look like, right? And are we in, in alignment, right? I've heard that quite a bit this morning in terms of alignment with district goals and changing technologies and whatnot. The master plan will capture all of those themes from a facility standpoint. Um, 
we also need to do this. So uh, California code, code of Regulations requires that districts embark on a master plan uh, you know, within a, a certain time period and update that master plan accordingly. So it, it really is that point in time for us to go and embark on this effort. The other piece we're, we're really proud of and happy that the master plan will include is school specific needs, right? So every school is unique. We've done quite a bit with respect to our bond program to date, yet we still need to take stock and identify what's been left off, right? What, what are those unmet needs? What do we still need to do next? Um, again, just speaking to unique schools, unique styles, unique communities and infrastructure and facilities for that matter. And then of course, providing a solution that, that fits every one of those school needs. Uh, and the master plan is geared up to capture all of that. Just a bit of history with respect to the master plan. Um, this, as far as I could go back there, I'm sure there was master plans well before this as well, but this takes us back to uh, you know, the Measure K and Measure E dates. So uh, master plan adopted by the school board in 2008, updates accordingly in 2013, roughly five years later, um, roughly three years later, and in gear up for Measure E, uh, another update of the master plan at that point in time. The bulk of those efforts were taken on uh, by some in-house facility staff, but also by architectural firms who help piece that together. They typically do this for district clients up and down the state and the country for that matter. So they're very well versed in, in how to embark on those efforts and endeavors as well. We, so going to where we are now, right? Um, I joined the district in November of 2019, so almost a year and a half or so. And one of the first things we started working on and I started working on was updating our district-wide facility master plan. Um, for me, it was very beneficial joining the district, getting to know the facilities and the in, ins and outs of every one of those school needs. Uh, but it, also we were hitting that five-year mark. So it just felt like the appropriate time to update that effort. I mentioned earlier that COVID slowed us, our, our efforts a little bit, um, not all together but more so because we were refocused on accelerated construction and making sure classrooms are ready for the return to in-person instruction. So we do feel it's an appropriate time to circle back and update this plan. We have quite a bit we've done to date with respect to needs assessment and taking stock primarily in terms of what those needs are at each respective site. Um, but we're ready for that next step and I'll highlight some of that along the way. Now, what have we done? Um, one of the largest components of a, f a school facility master plan is the incorporation of an educational specification, right? So what are we setting out to do? It, it's, uh, we'd be kind of going blind if we didn't in essence have an educational specification that outlines the needs of a classroom and a school and what that program should look like. So the district, and this is prior to my time, uh, the district had embarked on this effort and really completed that effort upon my arrival. Um, in terms of meeting with stakeholders, getting feedback from educators and non-educators alike, bringing in focus groups and just talking to folks across the board to develop what that plan looked like. There were several different focus groups across different cross sections of the district and ultimately the board approved those educational specifications in early 2020. I mentioned facility needs assessments because that's a big component of a master plan. I, I've already highlighted taking stock, but of course we need to know what's left to do, right? So is it more infrastructure needs that are kind of screaming out for help? Is there building needs out there across the border, certain parts of the district? The needs assessment, the physical walkthroughs of every one of these spaces is, is what gets us there. Cost, um, we know cost on the construction site has increased and escalated over the years. You know, typically it can go anywhere from two to 5% per year. Um, these are different times, so we've had a few projects bid of late and we've seen some of those unique bids, right? In some cases, cost coming in a little higher, in some cases, it being a little stable and we've benefited from some of those bids of late as well. Regardless, we need to account for that as part of the master plan and make sure that we include that inflation and escalation factor because as we know, as we set up a roadmap for future improvements, some of these improvements might not happen for the next five, 10, 15 or so years. So we need to account for some escalation. And then of course, um, outreach and feedback. So roughly one year ago, perhaps a little, a, a little more, um, we started the next batch of efforts with respect to getting community feedback on the master plan. Um, we held various meetings, some of those that you see pictured there as well. So a meeting at, at different parts of the district, one at Pauley, um, one at Lakewood, one at Jordan, and then one in this very room, and you actually see that one pictured down below as well. 
So in inviting schools, and, and even though we hosted at the high school level, we invited all the feeder schools from the area, so we invited elementary school parents and students and community members to attend in their respective area. We actually left it open so that they could attend multiple meetings as well because perhaps they want to chime in and comment on another plan at another campus. Um, attendance varied uh, across each of those meetings. Some heavily attended, some not so much. But we really um, were able to capture what we were looking for, which is additional feedback with respect to our tentative uh, master plan improvements. This is a sample. So if I circle back here, you see folks gathered around the large tables, right? The six foot tables, looking at plans and drawings. What you see on the next slide here is a sample on what they were looking at. So what we showed for each respective school in the district across those tables was a, a current snapshot uh, of a site plan, um, identifying buildings in, in field spaces, parking spaces, blacktop spaces, really anything and everything that's on the school campus. And then right next to it, we showed what it could be, right? So but based on feedback, stakeholder groups, staff input, these are areas that we identified as needs to date. What we wanted from the community was a few things, and we gave them various tools. We gave them markers and crayons and post-it notes and whatnot to mark up our drawings, physically mark them up right then and there on the spot. So folks would identify these drawings, and we'll just pick on McKinley here, for example, and perhaps they looked at the new turf field segmented in there, right? And they said, we really enjoy that. Let's mark that up. Let's put a few check marks there so district staff knows that's a priority for us. Um, perhaps we didn't capture something, right? Uh, you know, we identified things up here such as parking and drop off. Uh, community member or a teacher or a staff member may have identified that as, as a unique need or a larger need. And they could have said, look, can you look at or investigate expanding that area, right? So we had comments across the board on every one of those drawings. We'll incorporate that feedback into the master plan as well. And of course, I'm just picking on McKinley here, but we had that example for every school site in the district. Common themes. So uh, uh, nice smooth transition here because some of these common themes were outlined as part of those efforts, right? It's things we heard across the table and across those rooms from the various stakeholders that were in the room. Others are observations that facility staff and, and folks on our side of the house are noticing to date. So there's quite a few things listed here. Um, first and foremost, air conditioning. So I highlighted that as part of our Measure E efforts, we've embarked on HVAC projects at a number of campuses. It does not include every campus though. So there's certain sites, roughly 34 or so, that at that point in time uh, did not fall within the Measure E program. We're seeing that as a need going forward. Um, in some cases, you know, Cabrillo High School, for example, relatively newer campus, had HVAC systems as part of the uh, initial construction, yet those systems are now starting to get dated. Uh, technology advances very rapidly, right? Uh, the efficiency factors built into these units change drastically. So we know that within the next five to 10 to 15 years, that's gonna become a need for us going forward. Other sites such as Stevenson, uh, we've captured the HVAC component as part of the auditorium updates, yet we, we should still circle back and identify that as, as a need at the rest of the campus. They have HVAC units, uh, barred units we call them, uh, yet they're in essence attached to older buildings, right? So we know that there's still gonna be infrastructure needs, future needs that we should capture as part of this master plan going forward. And, and in a sense, uh, really what we see is, and I'm gonna use the word equity, right? So the, the dated systems, the older systems that were deemed new at that point in time are now not gonna be on par with the Measure E sites that we're embarking on and improving right now. Uh, portable removal, so you see one aerial snapshot there, and we have several of these examples, right? Campuses that have 20 plus portables or bungalow facilities that are really screaming to be something different. Uh, perhaps a two-story building to save on, on the footprint on the campus and, and just make us more efficient and get a space that's a bit more permanent as well. Really affords us the opportunity to do different things with classrooms, make spaces more unique, perhaps larger, versus being confined to that 960 square foot box that a portable provi provides. Um, there are sites that are, that are currently in our radar uh, with this very need, Cumberly, Muir, um, Webster, Polly, Mann, and, and quite a few more, right? So those are just certain examples to, to kind of paint the picture of that need that we see. Core facilities, Alan's actually addressed this one quite a bit in the past as well. 
you know, it's great that we're doing things in the classrooms and that should be our focus, right? For good reason, just to make sure teachers teach and students learn in an air conditioned space. Um, yet we do see a need going forward in our core facilities, in our auditoriums, our gymnasiums, our library spaces, uh, community spaces for that matter, right? Because they're used quite a bit off and on and after hours as well. Uh, playground and green spaces. So you saw it pictured there under McKinley, uh, but that's an observation we've seen and we've heard from quite a few folks. There are school sites with, with a large need for just green space. That can be synthetic turf, that can be natural grass. Really what folks are screaming for is just green space, play space that they can use outdoors. Um, technology upgrades. Again, we're doing quite a bit with respect to our current program, voice amplification, um, screens, projectors and whatnot yet it changes, right? So we wanna make sure we capture that need going forward as part of this master plan effort as well. And then the last bullet point here is furniture and equipment. Um, definitely not last for any reason other than it just showed up there on the slide, um, but a big need and big game changer is what we would say. So a as we embark on these improvements across school sites and add HVAC and renovate spaces and address cosmetic needs, um, it definitely shows, and it's drastically different when you walk into a room with the older furniture versus the newer, modern, flexible furniture, right? So we've been into some of those spaces. We've seen and pictured some of those spaces as well. That's something we wanna capture as a component of this next master plan as well. So what are our next steps with respect to the master plan? Hiring a consulting firm. Um, we've done quite a bit of the legwork. We have quite a bit of work product that we feel we can turn over to a consultant but we feel we're at that point in time where we just want them to come in, put that final bow on it, identify needs we might have missed uh, based on their area of expertise and just package a professional plan to put together for the board's consideration. Um, we currently have that out. So there's an RFP out for consulting firms to submit and propose on that project. So we'll have a recommendation relatively soon. Additional stakeholder input, because it's been a chunk of time and, and things change and feedback changes, right? We wanna circle back and, and gather more community input, whether that be in the form of additional community meetings or whether it be in the form of, di of additional surveys just to reach more folks. Uh, we're very much open to what we do in that respect, uh, but we feel that's, that's something we should address going forward. Cost estimates, I highlighted this earlier. Um, again, things change, they change regularly. The bid market's changing quite a bit these days but we we'll wanna make sure we capture that. And with the help of a consulting firm, we could get that expertise to do so as well. And our overall goal here is to wrap up this effort, you know, ideally within this calendar year. Uh, again, being that we feel comfortable and confident in the work product to date, that's very achievable. So getting our firm on board just to put those finishing touches on board, gathering that additional um, survey feedback or whatnot could help us and keep us in line uh, for that end date as well. Now, before transitioning, as promised, uh, I feel probably an appropriate time to break here for a few minutes and just field any questions or um, perhaps comments or feedback from the board. Oh, um, and if not, we'll I, motor right through. <laughs> yeah, um, Dr. Benitez and then Ms. Kerr. Uh, thanks, uh, David. And you know, first and foremost, uh, love that project by board uh, district um, slide. Um, two, two questions, uh, David. One is um, related to uh, keep showing us pictures of ducks because now more than ever, right, um, clean air and ventilation, uh, I think it's important for our community members to know our, our efforts. So I'm good, I'm excited about duck pictures. Uh, but my question is related to that. So given that many of our HVAC projects pre-COVID uh, were being done uh, a certain way, are, are there significant changes to how we've been doing or implementing the HVAC projects, whether it's scope, products that we're using, uh, vendors that we're working with in, in the midst of COVID, but also learning from that moving forward, right? Because a big component uh, of our bond money was around HVAC. Uh, uh, stuff. So just an HVAC specific question, again, whether it's different filters that are now available or on the market, uh, just, you know, give us, give us some insight because I do think not that clean air wasn't important before, but again, as we're going to, uh, you know, transition to in-person instruction, 
uh, around what clean air and ventilation uh, means you know, in relation to our HVAC work. Great, great question. And I flagged Alan over only because we're doing certain things on the measure E front, but also sure. things well outside of the bond program. Okay. So I feel he can speak to this one. First of all, th thank you for that question. It's a fantastic question. It is something that we're working with at all of our school sites to ensure they're providing you know, safe indoor air quality. Uh, it, taking a little bit of, of, uh, of credit to our West Side <coughs> community, uh, there was a lot of activity just prior and at the time that our major uh, E program w was being developed uh, as it relates to the concerns for air quality. Uh, mainly as it relates to uh, influences from the port, from our freeways, from just the, the juxtaposition of where Long Beach is at in relation to air quality. Uh, the, at that time, the district adopted a standard for all of our new construction of what's called MERV 16. So MERV 16 actually far exceeds what even the recommendation currently for the CDC is as it, as it relates to indoor air uh, filtration. And so all of our new Major E sites, and as we go forward, are all being designed with Major E filtration. And so that's a, that's a big win for us, which means essentially at this point, we didn't really have to do much with those sites. Now, we do have a lot of other sites that, that haven't afford, have been afforded the opportunity to uh, benefit from Major E. We are procuring air purification systems that will be delivering out to all of those classrooms that don't have the minimum of, of MERV 13. It's somewhat of a, of a mix, mismatch of, of different systems out there. Uh, as we look back into the you know, 90s when we were dealing with, uh, with track B schools and year round, we were doing all we could do to ensure that those schools were comfortable and could teach throughout the summer. Uh, so we have a, we have a kind of a, a mix match of, of different type of systems across the district. And we're uh, in the process of delivering those, those new air purifiers uh, this week. And, and getting them installed and ready to go by next week so that when those uh, teachers and students return to their classroom, they benefit from a level of air purification that's recommended by CDC. Thanks, Alan. And since you're up, my second question, I was thinking you, you, you probably will, will take on too. Dr. Benitez, can I ask just a clarifying question yeah, since he's on that subject? Yeah. Could you speak to, and I remember some of those meetings with Westside groups and talking about um, air quality and the filtration system. And I have a very clear memory of you mm -hmm. explaining that filtration mm -hmm. system. Could you speak to why um, windows aren't openable within those systems? Because I think that's a question that we've been hearing. Yeah. And I know it ties into what you just said about outside air versus inside air. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Thank Megan. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, really. Uh, as we designed our air conditioning systems, we recognized the fact that there are some air quality concerns in Long Beach and, and looking at what the quality of that outside air with our port and generators to the east and, and oil production facilities to the west and, and all of the type of influences that we have. Our air systems are designed in such a way per code, per ASHRAE standards, is to uh, filter and provide clean filtered outside air. At, tw at a rate of 25% of all of the air introduced into that classroom. So what does that mean? It means that for every hour, there are gonna be four complete air changes inside that classroom space. That air will be run through a, a, a air filter and provided to, to the students so it's safe, clean air being provided. All of the outside air is being filtered so that we remove any particulate matters, uh, any of that, that outside uh, material that we don't want to have introduced in the classrooms and provided to classrooms. So all of our current systems provide that, that superior air filtration. Uh, MERV 16, just to kind of give you a standard, is a similar, uh, the same filtration that's used in hospital operating rooms. Uh, it's used in, in medical facilities as a way to uh, remove any, uh, any contamination that may be in the air to ensure that those patients uh, get clean air at, as they're being serviced. So, we adopted that uh, way back in like 2016, 17, and we've been implementing that across our program moving forward. Yeah, my second question, Alan, is I didn't uh, hear it and I, didn't, I don't see it in the upcoming slides. If at a future um, board meeting, we can get a community workforce development agreement uh, update. It's, it's been a while. I know we took a, a pause there because of COVID. Um, uh, but, but again, given that there were a lot of exciting components, one of a kind components, it was a cutting edge agreement. If we could at a for future board meeting get an update on, on that, that would be great. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Benitez, for letting me jump in there. I appreciate it. And I'm excited that our first uh, 
project under that community workforce agreement is at Jordan High School. So um, thank you for that continued work and I look forward to an update as well. Um, Alan, you touched on the point um, that I wanted to talk about in terms of air quality, um, but the 34 sites that are not included in Measure E, my understanding, those are sites that had air conditioning at a different time. And it goes back to what you talked about. In the 90s, when we were at our peak enrollment, we had to start Track B schools. That was a program that was funded out of state dollars to air condition those schools for us. So we didn't include those, but that was 24 or five years ago. So to put that in, in context for me is if I have an air conditioner in my house that's 25 years old, it's probably end of life. It's probably not as effective as it should be. So just wanted to confirm my suspicions were correct around those sites, that it wasn't that they were intentionally left off the list. Because when you look at those sites, they are disproportionately in the more dense parts of our city because that's where we had populations that needed track B schools and that said yes to being track B schools. So there's a whole history as to why those air conditioned schools are in the communities that they are. So I think it's appropriate that as we plan for the future, we're planning to upgrade those schools because we can't say, well, they had air conditioning first. They had air conditioning 25 years ago and it's time for them to have a system that is exactly what you talked about in terms of those specifications that we are tinkering with those because we've asked this question before as best we can to keep them running and to keep them as in the most optimum settings that a 20 year old air conditioning system can be. Um, so I just wanted to, to lift up that those 34 sites are critical sites for our schools and families, um, many in my district, um, and that they, are, they need to be included in the plan moving forward the way that our other schools have. So I think that was all I had, thank you. Mr. Otto, did you have a question? Or? No. No, well, your mic is on. Um, okay, so okay. I think uh, we can proceed. Okay, great, great. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think uh, I would think I'd be remiss without taking an opportunity, since how we just finished a discussion on, on master planning, to recognize a lot of the hard work that our friends and facilities have done for this very same facility that we're in here today, and what can be done uh, when you focus on what students need uh, to be successful. So. Uh, part of that master plan is really being able to build facilities such as this beautiful Browning High School. So uh, Dave and his team have done a great job in, in, in keeping that, that effort moving. So today I want to talk a little bit about uh, our asset management uh, program that, that we've been working on for quite some time. Unfortunately, due to, due to a lot of things, uh, it was delayed due to our refocusing on, on supporting uh, the effort for, for responding to COVID. But our asset management team is really where we're looking at some of the properties that the district currently owns and really uh, looking at them very closely to ask the question, what are our future needs for those properties and whether or not those properties are something that we uh, want to keep or, is, or can we do something else with them, namely sell them or market them uh, for other purposes uh, across the district. So just a little bit of a historical background, back in August of 2019, uh, we, we came to the board and, uh, and the board appointed an asset advisory committee. This is required uh, per ed code uh, to have a cross-section group of individuals from our community that actually works with us to study what these properties are and what our current uses for these properties are and look at our current needs or our future needs, excuse me, uh, in terms of uh, student attendance projections in terms of uh, program changes, if there's new and additional programs that the district is bringing on, and all of the, as uh, the aspects of what our, what our current and future needs are for properties across the district. Uh, the asset committee uh, met from August until March. We had, I think, seven meetings where we met, including a, uh, including a public hearing where we invited members of the public to come in and, and uh, talk to us about their thoughts and perspectives. Uh, we didn't get anybody from the public for, for that public hearing, but we, did, we held it and we gave opportunities in advance notice to come in and talk to us. Uh, in March of 2020, uh, the board accepted the recommendation report from the asset committee uh, where it talked about uh, recommendations for things like sales and leases and, 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 uh, and, and other dispositions of that property. Uh, in August, uh, excuse me, October of 2020, the board directed staff to take that report and do some further, further assessment and provide future recommendations uh, on what we think would be the best use of those properties and final disposition of those properties coming forward, and that's what we're bringing to you today. Uh, 
from October through February, through, through now, uh, we've been reviewing those properties. We've been working with outside consulting staff. We've been working with estimates on property valuations. We've been looking at uh, future needs and other aspects that I'll be talking about in just a moment about what to do with those, those properties. We've even held meetings with various different interested parties uh, that would be interested in potentially acquiring those properties and, and doing something with those pro properties, both private interests as well as uh, community-based nonprofit interest uh, to look at, at, at what the, po the potential for some of these locations could be. Uh, so really just to, to, to kind of frame where we're going from here, the, the properties in question, the properties that were part of the Asset Advisory Committee were uh, 999 Atlantic Avenue, which is currently a vacant facility, 4310 Long Beach Boulevard, which is again a vacant facility, better known as the Willows. Uh, we also look closely at our district administrative offices, and I'll go into a minute about why we looked at that. Uh, we looked at uh, 723 Long Beach Boulevard, which is a non-vacant uh, parking lot near Oropesa. We looked at uh, 2201 Market Street, which is our current uh, purchasing and, and warehouse facility. Our 2525 Webster, which is our current uh, facility support, uh, maintenance and operations and facilities location and 2700 Pine Avenue, which is our transportation department, and looked at those units. I want to note at this point that none of these facilities are educational facilities. None of these facilities house students or are used for school purposes, and I'll talk a little bit about that as we go through this. Uh, so we're not looking at closing any schools or doing anything of that order. These are our support facilities, and we wanted to take a really close look at them to see if there needed to be some changes in the district moving forward. Um, excuse me. Before you move on, uh, you mentioned a parking lot. Um, is that a parking lot adjacent to Oropesa? It is, yes. Is that the pocket? Is that the little pocket park that we're talking about, Alan, that, that, that has grass on it right now? No, it's, it's, it's literally a, an asphalt parking lot that, uh, that is between Oropesa and Long Beach Boulevard. I'll show you a map of it in okay. just, just a moment okay. uh, to show you what it is. It's currently just used exclusively for parking for Oropesa Elementary School. Okay, so is, is, will that be a part of your presentation? And yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll Thank be you. talking about our recommendation about what we think for that property at this point. Thank you. So just kind of digging a little bit deeper into the properties, what you have here in front of you is a, uh, an overhead view of 999 Atlantic uh, Avenue. This is a, uh, it was built in 1990. Uh, it's a three-story office building. It's about 19, a little bit, almost 20,000 square foot office building. Uh, it's on a lot size of about 14,800 square feet. It's currently vacant. Uh, we currently, some of our concerns about this property is we have current ongoing maintenance needs and, and operational costs due, due to its vacancy uh, and its location of the city. Uh, if we move on a little bit deeper, we acquired this property in 1999. And we've used it for various different purposes over the years. Most recently, it was used for personnel commission. Uh, that was where the personnel commission offices were housed for many years. Following the personnel commission, it was used as our major K facilities bond office for a period of time before it became vacant. Uh, we vacated the property uh, in 2014. Uh, and again, it's not suitable for educational purposes. And, and all of these properties, uh, I'm gonna be talking about that, but I wanted to be clear what that means. Uh, in the state of California, for us to put a teacher or students into a building, the building must be compliant with, with the FIELD Act. That's the, the uh, California Building Code that requires us to comply with Title 24, which is our building standards. Mm -hmm. So in order for us to use a building for, for educational purposes for students and teachers, the building must be compliant with the FIELD Act. It is possible that we could, we could reconstruct these buildings to be compliant, but it's extremely costly endeavor to do that. Uh, as we look at, at the final use of these buildings. So uh, when, we, when we answered that question about whether or not we could uh, potentially house us an educational program there, typically the answer is no, we cannot without an ex ex exceedingly large amount of money being spent to rebuild those buildings. So again, 999 uh, is it not suitable for educational purposes. We currently have about a $40,000 per year ongoing cost that we spend in that property. Uh, there's, a, there's a continuous challenge of, uh, of homeless individuals around that property. 
uh, that, that break in continuously. We have a lot of responses that, that we do with our school safety department. Uh, our maintenance folks are out there continuously uh, continuing to board up and, and ensure that the building is secure and safe. Uh, currently, uh, we're tracking at about $40,000 a year that we spend just, just uh, keeping the property safe and secure uh, as we move forward. Uh, as of September of 2019, and I wanna note this, this is pre-COVID, we would need to update these numbers as we move forward, but pre-COVID, uh, our market estimate was just a little bit over $3 million for that, that piece of property. Uh, it's immediately adjacent to St. Mary's Hospital, uh, and, and I think at one point in its past, it was used for a medical clinic uh, at some point in, it, in its past. Uh, right now, we don't see any current or future need to keep that property. So moving into 4310 Long Beach Boulevard. And by the way, if you have any questions about a particular property, if you could just let me know, we can, we can address those as, as we go forward. Uh, so 4310 Long Beach Boulevard, this is what we call the Willows. Uh, the building was originally built in 1979. It's a two-story office building, about 17,500 square feet. The lot size is 14,960. Uh, it's in, an, in kind of a commercial, commercial area of the city. Uh, and it's currently been uh, vacant at this time. We acquired this property back in 1998, and it was previously used for our special education offices. Our, our special education division was housed there, and following that, for a short period of time, we housed our Office of Media Services, or what is now known as Marketing and Media Services, our gentleman right over here, uh, were housed in that facility for a while as we were rebuilding Renaissance. Uh, it's been vacant since 2017. Uh, it, again, is not suitable for educational use. Uh, we currently have about a $90,000 a year ongoing cost in order to keep that property vacant and, and make sure that it's safe and secure. Uh, back in 2019, our valuation for that property was about $1.6 million for that piece of property. And again, at this point, we don't see any future or current need to, to maintain that property. So moving into uh, 1515 Hughes Way. So 1515 was originally built in 1984. It's a four-story, just a little bit under 79,000 square foot office building with 50% share in, in an uh, outdoor parking facility behind the building. It's currently used as our district's administrative offices. It's and again, it's currently occupied. Uh, it's not suitable for educational purposes, which I'll, which I'll mention in, in just a moment. Uh, we originally acquired this property in 1995. Uh, the, really what we identified with 1515 is the, the property currently sits at, at the extreme westerly edge of our district, actually kind of northwesterly edge of our district. Uh, it really has a lot of challenges as it relates to providing uh, a comprehensive community access to that facility. Uh, there are some challenges related to being able to get there. There aren't any major, major transit lines that actually uh, uh, provide access to that building. Uh, as it relates to servicing our school sites, uh, it is about as far away from most school sites as you can get, uh, especially to, to service any school sites along our eastern boundary. Uh, so there's a lot of logistical challenges with that, with that property and, and currently where it sits. Uh, there are some space utilization uh, issues within the property, and also there's, there's a point where we would have to consider uh, m uh, continuing upgrades to the, to the building as we move forward. We recently did an HVAC upgrade. We would then need to look at, through our facilities plan, uh, additional monies that would need to be spent at the building to keep those upgrades moving. Back in September, December of 2019, we valued the property uh, a little bit over $13.5 million uh, for that property. Uh, and obviously, at this point, we still have current need. Uh, we really need to, to consider, as we look at that property, the current and future needs for an administrative center. There needs to be a boardroom. There needs to be community access. There's a lot of need and a lot of, a lot of functions that come out of that building that we would need to make sure that we consider as we consider the, the possibility of, of moving or relocating or disposing of that property moving forward. I'll move a little bit uh, further into uh, 2201 Market Street. Uh, this is currently our procurement division and our warehousing area. Uh, it was built in 1969. It's currently an industrial building with a gross square feet of just a little bit over 150,000 square feet. 
It's currently used by our, by our warehouse purchasing branch and it has parking and loading facilities, loading dock facilities that's associated with it. Uh, some of the challenges, it's, it's location. Again, it's in kind of the northerly area of our, of our district, uh, right on the border. Uh, it has some uh, access challenges. Uh, it's kind of tucked behind a, uh, a residential apartment building and what I think is currently like a, used to be a Zodi's or something years ago. It was a, it was a different retail center that, that's immediately in front of it. So it does have logistical challenges associated with its location. Uh, the lot size is just a little bit under eight acres. It's currently occupied and, and used to support those facilities. Uh, we acquired this property in 1987. And again, as I said, it's currently used for warehousing and purchasing operations. Uh, this facility would not be suitable for educational uses. Uh, it would, it would, it's clearly a warehouse facility and office space that, that, that has been used at. Again, as I said, it's the extreme northerly boundary of the district. Back in October of 2019, we valued this at about $24,500. Uh, some of the challenges that we would face uh, is really looking at where we would relocate a facility of this, of this nature. Uh, we would have some potential zoning and environmental issues associated with moving a, a, this type of facility. Uh, not that it, it's not possible, but we'd need to be looking very closely at how we would replicate those functions at, a, at a, another facility. And again, we do have current and future needs for continuing our warehousing operations and our, pur our purchasing operations uh, moving forward. 2425 Webster. Uh, this, this facility was built in, in 1954. It's currently our facility support and maintenance division. Uh, there's six buildings, four industrial buildings, and one main office building. There's a few modulars. Uh, it's about 58,200 square or 120 square feet of office and, and building space uh, on just under seven acres. Uh, it's currently occupied and used to support our maintenance and our facilities division. Uh, we acquired this property back in 1953. I believe it was acquired through uh, part of the Navy transition as the Navy moved out of that area and we began to acquire that property. It's immediately adjacent to Hudson uh, K-8 or which would now be elementary school. Uh, so it's, it's, it was part of that overall land acquisition. It's currently used by our maintenance operations facilities division. Again, not suitable for educational purposes. Uh, one, of the, one of the logistical challenges here is it is at our extreme western boundary. Uh, as we think about servicing schools and the, the operations that come from there, it becomes logistically challenged to be able to then send out teams and, and maintenance crews out of that location. We do have a satellite yard over at Bixby to help mitigate some of those challenges uh, where we do a lot of the functions out of Bixby, but still we have a lot of, of the, the larger tools, the larger equipment, uh, and the, the, the single uh, type services that we do, such as asphalt that we, ma that we manage out of this facility. Uh, again, challenges to moving or relocating would be really the property values in Long Beach, looking at a facility that's large enough to be able to relocate this type of function. And again, we're going we're gonna to be challenged with zoning and environmental issues as we look at things like uh, the noise associated with moving a maintenance yard into, a, into another, another location of the district and also some of the, uh, some of the maybe uh, latent uh, environmental issues that, that, the, that may be at the property that we would have to deal with. Uh, Again, there is a current and future need uh, to retain these services somewhere in the district. Moving on, talking about 2700 Pine Avenue. This uh, facility is right next to Robinson uh, K-8 School. Uh, it's currently our transportation department. Uh, the facility was built in 1953. Uh, it, has our, it has an industrial transportation facility and garage with parking. It's about 10,000 square foot of facility. Uh, it's, again, I used by our transportation division. Uh, the lot size is just a little under two acres, immediately adjacent to Robinson K-8, and it's currently uh, occupied with our, with our staff. We acquired this property back in 1994. Uh, it is not suitable for educational purposes, and one of our, one of our concerns of looking at this property was its, its location in the district. It's not quite our westerly border, but it's definitely on the westerly side of our, of our district and all of our uh, uh, vehicle operations are serviced out of there, all of our transportation department is serviced out of there. And again, the challenges with just not being centrally located to the district uh, that, that that creates. 
The property valuation is about the three and a quarter million dollars back in October of 2019. If we were to move some of the, looking at some of the values of what properties would cost in Long Beach in order to relocate, and again, I'll mention the zoning and, and, and uh, environmental issues uh, associated with moving a uh, transportation and a garage facility to another location of the district uh, would be something we'd take into account. We do have current need for retaining these operations. I think lastly, I think this is the last one I'm gonna talk about today, uh, is uh, 723 Long Beach Boulevard. This is that little parking lot that is right next to Oropesa Elementary School. It actually is, is, uh, is uh, right between Oropesa and Long Beach Boulevard. It's, a, it's currently a parking lot. It's just an open air parking lot, about 7,500 square feet. It's currently used for the parking for the Oropesa staff. Uh, it's located in a uh, PD30 zone of the city, which, which uh, we really need to be uh, concerned about because of the, it limits what we can do with that facility. And, and there's a lot of incentives in that area for, for the development of, of that area. So that could be some advantages that we have in considering what this property, uh, what a final use of this property might be. We acquired this property way back in 1964. Uh, it's again, currently used for parking for the Oropesa staff. There's about 25 open air parking uh, stalls at that area. Uh, it is in an impacted area of Long Beach with limited parking availability. Uh, it's something that we need to consider that if we were to eliminate that parking or dispose of that property, we would need to look at how do we replicate the parking opportunities for staff because there isn't really just street parking available. There isn't the opportunity to just park uh, in, in the community due to it due to its location. Uh, property valuation is about $725,000 in October of 2019. And again, as I said, challenges would be able to continue to support the Oropesa staff uh, as it relates to the, the, the access to, to continuing parking. And we have identified that there is a continual need for parking in that area. Uh, at, we've recognized that with things like Renaissance and the limited parking that they have and the challenges that, that they have. So I don't know if there's any questions before I get into recommendations about the, the individual properties that we were analyzing. And it, Just a quick one. Uh, Dr. Okay, we'll wait till after the recommendations, okay. yeah. yeah. Got it. So jumping into the recommendations, just uh, so our recommendations, recommend, recommendations today, I can say that word, uh, is the board to declare the properties at 999 Atlantic, which is currently vacant, 4310 Long Beach Boulevard, and 1515 Hughes Way to be, to be surplus. Now, one of the questions that pops up, wait, we're using 1515, why are we declaring it surplus? It's a requirement of our education code that we would need to do that officially as a body in order for us to have the ability, the flexibility to consider what the market may bear for uh, future disposition of that property. The board would need to do that in order for us to move on to look at other locations, to explore the market, on to see what the customer base may look like and whether there's interested parties in that. Uh, the board still has the ability to do nothing, to, to recommend that we just stay right where we're at, depending on what the, what the recommendations and what, uh, what the deal would look like that we'd potentially bring forward with, with some interested individual. So I wanted to be clear about that. Uh, we're also recommending that the board authorize staff to offer these properties to at market value for sale to, to all public agencies. This is as required by law. Uh, it requires us that we would number one, offer these properties to any other public agency that may have an interest in, in using this property for, for, for their uses. Uh, if no public entity expresses interest in the property, uh, we would proceed with a public offering of, of, uh, for anybody that would be interested in, in acquiring these properties and then doing some uh, private development on the properties. Our recommendation is to use the combined proceeds from the sale of the surplus properties uh, to acquire and relocate the district administrative offices. One of the biggest things that we've looked at and, and discussions we've had is being able to move our district office to an area that actually better serves our community. So again, our recommendation is that we take the proceeds from the sale of these three combined properties and use those to be able to relocate and uh, acquire and relocate those facilities to a new location. And lastly, our recommendation is to authorize staff to uh, take all appropriate actions to, to move that forward. Uh, 
And la lastly, the, you know, the recommendations declare the properties, the following properties as necessary to our operations to the district, which is the Market Street, the Webster Avenue, the Pine, and the Long Beach Boulevard address, but also for the board to direct staff to continue evaluating these properties and bring recommendations to the board as future needs or circumstances change. Really what we're saying is at this time, we don't feel it's prudent to look at, at doing anything with these particular properties, but yet there may be an opportunity in the future where, where circumstances change, where, where we can uh, look at uh, these properties either individually or in whole for some future disposition of these properties. But at this time, considering the market conditions and the, and the, the other, uh, the other uh, influences that we don't think it's a good time to do that. Uh, the recommendations board to direct staff to continue evaluation of the properties, I think I mentioned that, and then to maintain the current operations at these properties at this time. So, I'm available now for questions. Yes, Ms. Kerr. Thank you for our little cards. Um, this is gonna be no surprise to anybody in the room because I keep, I've talked about it before. Thank you for the comprehensive presentation. I really appreciate it. I wanted to wait till the recommendations came through because I wanted to, exp I wanted to hear what we are required to do by law with these properties um, before I ask us to figure out if there's a way uh, to think a little more broadly about the impact of these properties. Um, 10 acres in Long Beach doesn't exist anymore for purchase. Four acres doesn't exist anymore for purchase. Um, and so as we look at disposing of properties uh, that we currently have that are vacant and not suitable for education purposes, I wanna lean on, I, I will use my I statements, I would like us to lean on the vision and values that I hold for our community, some of which include um, housing, nonprofit work, and those kinds of opportunities that don't come around very often when we have potential for use of land. Um, we talk about equity. Um, I'm a little all over the place, so just give me a minute, I'll get there. Uh, we talked about property values pre-COVID, and we know that housing and the market has gotten even tighter in COVID. We know that our families are losing their housing. Um, they're having a hard time staying in their rental properties. Um, landlords have been raising rent. There has been some relief, but the federal eviction moratorium ends this month with local ones extended, but not at the federal level. So all of that to say, I understand that we have to offer these properties and thank you for the clarification to other public entities first, but I would really like us to have a discussion, um, you know, maybe some committee work around what would it look like to maintain a piece of property to work in partnership with a nonprofit, to work in partnership with a housing corporation that offers um, rent stabilized housing. And not from the perspective of it's just, in my opinion, the right thing to do, but it also is self-serving in that it allows our students to stay here if they couldn't afford to live in the ever increasing housing market that is a coastal city in California. Um, and so I think that's my ask today, that I understand that we have to go through certain motions and certain procedures per ed code and per law, um, but to look at ways that the public land that is now held serves our community in a bigger way other than an influx of one-time dollars, um, and I see that now, to potentially purchase another place for us to hold a meeting and to do executive work, which is necessary for the district. I don't discount that at all. Um, and that's the trade-off, is we would need some funding to do that that didn't, in, you know, didn't come out of other funding that would impact our students. But looking at our long-term community investment, is there a way to say that having families living on some of these properties is in our long-term vision and community value that we hold um, just as much as we need one-time money to purchase a building? Um, so again, not a surprise. I know we have nonprofits that have that are interested in some of those properties that it seems like in this process would be at the tail end of av availability unless I don't know. I don't know if there's a way to not to circumvent the process or to use the process to the advantage of the community in a way that isn't just about getting a check for property. Um, that feels hollow for me right now. 
So my, my ask is if we can continue the conversation. I don't, I don't have a problem with the recommendations as long as I, because you stipulated that we can still do nothing. So in that time that we take a pause to maybe do nothing, we explore ways that are creative and different and outside the work of what we have done in the past. Obviously, education is our main mission. But in supporting our community, how do we how do we do this work maybe a little more intentionally than what would have been transactional? Um, so that's a lot of talk. I don't know if there's an answer to that other than I know Yumi's over there looking at me, understanding that, and Dr. Baker, I've talked to you about this. I talked with Superintendent Steinhauser of how do we work together to potentially do something we've never done before at a time when we're doing eight million things we've never done before. Uh, but holding the value that there might be some long-term benefit for us being really creative in this time, um, especially where we are in, in our equity talks, in the housing market, post-pandemic. Um, so I guess I'm asking for time and I'm asking for uh, a willingness for us to work creatively, even if we need to bring in some outside folks to help us figure out how to do that, um, to maybe look at a different plan than just getting a check for property. And Alan, it, it might be useful to Mrs. Kerr's um, question, not to get into a whole presentation, but just to describe a work without naming the nonprofit organization, how you have been in consultation with them and how they fit into this conversation, just to give a glimpse at that if, if you want to, or if Yumi wants to. Do Dr. Baker, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm willing to hear that, but I, I wanna also be able to, um... let me ask first before I, I, I do that. So Brent, we have this before us tonight, a resolution. Um, it, I'm all good with having the conversation now. I'm just wondering if, if this is an item that we're taking action on tonight. Um, I, I wanna be cognizant of that and how I um, build from board member Kerr's uh, comments and then respond to any interaction we have with executive staff. So, uh, Brent, can we have that conversation now, given that this is an action item tonight on our agenda? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. It's, it's a great question. This action item, I'm sorry, this is a discussion item on this agenda. You can discuss it now. It's an action item on tonight's agenda. You could discuss it tonight or discuss it both. So you have, the answer is yes. You could discuss it in either place. So I think the question was uh, some of the work that we've already done in working with some of our uh, community partners, both uh, both our government community partners as well as some of the nonprofit groups. And we've we've had several uh, uh, remote opportunities, right, to meet with those individuals and talk about some of the interest and some of the potential uses for for some of these properties that are here today in front of you. Uh, some of those folks have been from within the city. We've had meetings with the folks in city development department and really looking at, at uh, how they may be able to bring in some, some private uh, partnerships to, to really look closely at these properties and provide, uh, provide uh, both housing opportunities as well as uh, other, other city functions. I think 999 was being looked at very closely as providing uh, maybe a, a home for some, uh, some, some uh, services to help support some of our needy uh, residents in our city. Uh, there was other properties that were looked as potential for housing developments for uh, interest with the, the hospital and, or up near uh, 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 some of our northern areas where we provide opportunities for our, for our uh, community members. So we have had those conversations. Uh, what we're doing tonight would not uh, eliminate us to continue to have those conversations. It really is a, uh, a point where the board has to give us that authority to be able to move into those conversations and be able to look at what is that, that, that fair market price. I think the intent is that the district, as we look at what our assets are and what the value of those assets are, is to ensure that we're, we're getting the, the, the best price. In fact, the, uh, the law does tie our hands a little bit on what we can do as it relates to uh, offering it up to individuals or especially private parties, private nonprofits that that wouldn't be the best value. So we don't have a lot of latitude in that, uh, but we can work closely with city officials and others to create some some opportunities for us to get the best, best value of those properties. I think the intent really though is that we uh, we try to get the, the best value so that we can address some of our own community concerns with the relocation of our administrative offices. 
is, is really kind of what the intent of that is. And I appreciate that clarification. I think that's part of the conversation that we're not necessarily aware of that's been happening, happening at a staff level. So that's helpful to know. And, and like I said, I understand the need to move forward and that that requires an action to be able to move forward, but it also allows us, again, to, to pause in that moving forward. Um, so I appreciate that we're talking to all those entities. I know we don't uh, get necessarily into the weeds of what all of those are, but it's really important for me to, to continue to be apprised of, of what some of those options are. And, and you know, I'll, I'll put out my worst case scenario is that we go through this process, we work with either the city or someone else, and a developer comes in and builds market rate housing that our families can't afford in a part of town that, you know, it isn't appropriate. So, and we've seen that happen in different parts of the city. So as someone who has a, a heart for housing and those experiencing homelessness, we know that many of our students fall in those situations, um, that we're just as cautious as we can be and as thoughtful as we can be, maybe in a way that we haven't had to be in the past. So thank you. Um, thank you. Mr. Otto? Oh, I'm sorry, you weren't finished? Sorry. Uh, Dr. Benitez and then Mr. Otto. Yeah, and I just wanted to um, hold off to get clarification on how I could then comment on Board Member Kerr's uh, uh, comment. So, since we're having the discussion now, I am 100% in support of what Board Member Kerr uh, has expressed. And, and I would actually um, expand it in such a way that helps to inform we have some time before this comes up to us tonight, so I'm gonna ask real specific questions on what you just shared, um, Alan. So roughly here, we're talking about value of around 18 to 19 million uh, for those three properties. I did some quick math so someone can, can double check on that. Uh, it seems to me that we have, by policy, three options before us, board member, and, and again, um, 100%, whether it's a community benefits consideration, mixed use, affordable housing, uh, and our board can take a lead uh, in this regard. That a couple years ago, we put some feelers out on whether a housing, affordable housing bond would fly, uh, right? Given the context that board member Kerr just laid out. And um, although it's not um, common, it's not unheard of for school districts to move forward on affordable housing uh, policy, given uh, the needs that we have here in, in Long Beach. So I think we have three sort of scenarios um, as attached to this resolution that we're asked to consider uh, tonight to take action on. The first is um, if, if we move forward with that first step of, of a public entity, um, we control sort of the criteria by which public entities may or may not be interested uh, in that. We have a lot of say on, hey, look, this is for sale, but here are some considerations, right? If a public entity. Uh, so, you know, if, if, that's, if, if that's an option that we'd be explicit in saying, these are, these are the types of public partnerships that we would be interested in, in selling uh, under, under that condition. And that goes to your point, Alan, and I'm, and I'm, I'm glad you said it that way. Best value, what does best value mean? If we take purely the financial, and that's the common thing to take, I think then we, we pigeonhole ourselves into the look, a board member, that we're going after money. Uh, and that in and, of, in and of itself isn't a bad thing to many, but to some of us, if we want to uphold this value around equity, that's a hard lens, right? That we're, we're, we're chasing money and a time that uh, a lot of these unmet needs uh, are not being addressed in our community. Second scenario, um, we keep the properties, we don't move forward with, 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 with uh, um, the recommendation, keeping in mind that if that's what we need to do to have a more robust conversation around what we wanna do with these properties, if indeed we wanna sell under what scenario would that occur, you know, that's an option, uh, right? But I think there's a third option here, and I don't, I'm not, I don't think it's mutually exclusive from that first option, uh, Alan, that we have to do our due diligence to go to, to, to uh, public entities first before um, offering the properties up. 
and it has to do with the best value piece. If we go out and get the best value financially for these properties, um, according to what I heard from you, Alan, there's nothing to preclude us if we've, if we've said we're going to use the earnings from those properties to look at uh, other potential properties for our district offices. There would be nothing to preclude us, as I'm understanding it, Alan, that we could look for properties that could have not, that could house not just our school district administrative operations, that we could include uh, a, a community spaces for nonprofits uh, in that building or what have you, and our properties that could accommodate more than that. Another scenario, as I'm understanding, Alan, and again, I, I, that's why I think it's important how, what we're voting on on this resolution, all right, could be that we think about that best value as uh, not just and I don't want to trivialize that, looking for another building to house our administrative operations, but leveraging any revenues to um, invest in what board member Kerr uh, just expressed. And, and I'm, not, I'm not sure of, of those three, you know, what information we need, Alan, but if, if taking action on the recommendation precludes us from entertaining any of those three scenarios, and if there's more than more, I think it's important for us to know that uh, when, we, when we take this vote downstairs. So thoughts on that, Alan? Yeah, so first thought is that when we, uh, there was one question about working with our, our public entities. And so when we do work with a pub, another public entity, we do have some ability to do a, what's called a negotiated transition or a negotiated sale. So that you can put some terms and you can look at what is in the best interest of the district for different programs that may be uh, offered for that property. As it relates to a private sale, we have much more constraints at, at, at the state level because it's considered to be public, public dollars. And so uh, we very much have to consider uh, almost the highest bidder type of an environment when we go to a, a, a private sale. So I want to be clear about that. Uh, secondly, as we move forward, what to do with the proceeds? And yes, the board does have latitude to determine uh, if the relocation of the board office, as we're recommending today, uh, is the best use of those proceeds to use those for other purposes that the board determines is, is, is necessary. So in answer to your last question is there, there is latitude there. The recommendation as we're presenting it tonight though is to use those monies for the relocation of the board building uh, because we had identified that as, as, as one of the highest needs at, at this time. Uh, so the recommendation before you is to, is to use those monies to relocate the board office. Mr. Otto. Yeah, I, I, I think the first thing that I, that I, and I think it's important, that, that I want to say is that I would much rather have this discussion tonight than now. And the reason for that is because we're going to probably have it tonight anyway. And if we're having it now, we're just taking twice as much time to talk about the same things. And this is less, a less appropriate form for it because it's not as transparent. People don't come to workshops as much as they listen to board meetings and this is the, exactly the kind of discussion that a board should have uh, and not have people say I didn't know about that. I mean quite frankly if, 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 if it was 40 years ago the headline in the newspaper tomorrow would be uh, school district uh, you know abandoning its uh, headquarters or uh, going someplace else I don't think we're going to get that but, uh, but f first I'd rather have this discussion tonight and not do it now. But on a more general level, I think that we are unprepared to have this discussion without a report about what the possibilities are. I mean, are we talking about, do, does the school district wanna go into the social service business with regard to housing? I don't think so. I think we're an educational institution now. Obviously we do some, uh, we, we think about nutrition and that's important. And, but everything's related to education. And I think that you've got to draw a line because we also have responsibilities to be financially uh, prudent in how it is that we handle the monies that we have. And you know, it wasn't that long. I mean, we're talking about structural deficits. We're talking about problems that we have. And if we're gonna open this up to do all kinds of other things, I don't wanna do it about, hey, I just thought about this and what could we do this? And when I say a report, I, I think of our council saying, well, legally, what can we do? Uh, is it a good idea? I sat on a panel 
a couple of years ago at a, uh, a national conference about housing for community college students. And uh, the main speaker said, the biggest problem you have is dogs, because the students get there and then they abandon their dogs or their dogs bite somebody. And it never occurs to them, we don't know how to do that. I know, I know we're not talking about specifically doing that, but there are all kinds of questions. I support 100% the idea that what we need in this community is to have housing for people that have children that can go to our schools. But the way I'd rather see this done is talk about what it is that we need tonight, take a step back and say, what are the uh, legal issues? What are the uh, uh, educational issues? Um, what are the what, what are the things that we that we can do instead of just having a kind of a free flowing discussion about all this that uh, where nobody has very much information about it and it's more of a feel good discussion because there are things that we that we value but we really don't know how constrained we are and uh, so um, so that's my input. Um, thank you. Um, just to clarify, um, Ms. Kerr, when you're talking about housing, as far as what the recommendations before us are concerned, are you talking about us having a little bit more control over who we sell these properties to? What I'm hearing is that we don't um, necessarily want to see our properties go to a developer that will just contribute to the um, housing market in a way that doesn't take into consideration the needs for affordable housing. It wouldn't be that the school district is, is going into the housing business ourselves. So if you could clarify that. Sure, I think the answer to all of that is yes to all of it. But the answer is I don't know to all of it. So that was why my question was around process. And you clarified that we have an opportunity to do nothing after we do this. I appreciate the clarification that Dr. Benitez brought forward around what, what we're committing to in that. Um, so I, I don't, it's not, a, it's not really a free for all conversation. That's not where I'm going with it. What I'm asking us to do is to be thoughtful in the process of how we quote unquote dispose of property and make sure for me, it is important that we're not disposing of it in a transactional way to simply get the highest bid. That we could do that very easily. Tomorrow, all those things could go on the market, it could go to the highest bidder and, and the conversation is over. What I'm asking for um, is to not do something like that and to have a conversation about what the opportunities look like. Obviously, staff has been having conversations with different entities, nonprofits, the city, um, and we don't, I don't know enough about that. But I'm trying to be intentional in the choices that we make that impact our city for generations to come around land opportunities that don't come along, um, won't come along again. We are the largest landholder in the city. Um, so what I'm asking for is clarity in the process because what may happen is we take a pause and we have a conversation, we get updated on, on who we've been talking to, what potential plans are, we realize our hands are tied in certain ways which will inevitably lead to the way we dispose of the property. I get that. But I don't want to, I can't support making a decision that leads to us getting a check cut as soon as we sell properties because we always need the money. I would like to be more thoughtful and continue to have conversations. So if passing this allows for that pause and the continue of conversation, the continuing for staff to do the research around what we can and can't do uh, per law, per ed code, um, and then bringing in those other potential opportunities, I just wanna be able to have that conversation. I think a lot of times we have, we have meetings like this where we get information and then we end up in a meeting having to make a, a, de a decision around it um, where we bring in our community values, but not fully. So I know you're talking to entities. I would love to sit down and talk to ha have the opportunity to talk to staff to say, this is what's important to me. Can you keep that in mind when you're talking with other people? And uh, maybe Dr. Benitez or Mr. Otto wants to do that as well so that you hear from us. 
what those values that we represent of our community are in the work that we do moving forward around something that is really going to be a once in a generation opportunity. So I know we don't, I don't want it to drag on forever. Do we want to be in the business of affordable housing the way some other districts in Northern California have been? I don't know, but that's not even a question. That's not a conversation for today and it's not a conversation that we've started. But there are conversations that happen like that with education entities. So I'm asking for time and thoughtfulness as we move forward in a process and not rushing into something um, that yields money in the bank only. That, that was my, my point. I, it's not, I've brought it up before. Um, I don't want to rush through this. I, I want to be able to take time and know that staff has heard what's important to me and that we've talked about what's important to us collectively as a board, as representatives of the community in this space around this big decision. So that's, that's where I'm coming from. I'm not asking for us to build housing because Megan would build housing. That's what I would do because that's personally important to me. But I, I am asking for us to engage in a process that allows us to have conversations with staff on the context of what is legal and what is appropriate, but also maybe not traditional. There might be opportunities there. That's what I'm asking for. I, I appreciate that. Um, w one moment, Dr. Benitez. I appreciate that. I would also like to add that um, the purpose of the workshop is so that we work things out. And from a legal point of view, the only time the board is able to work things out, the five of us together without um, creating a Brown Act violation is in a public meeting. And so even though the workshops might not be accessible or widely viewed as our board meetings, this is the forum, this is the venue where we have the opportunity for these discussions. So it's, um, it's very beneficial that, that this is the time when we hash things out. Uh, but I do wanna go on record as, um, as agreeing with the, um, with the intention of, of, of selling these properties in a way that benefits our communities, in a way that, um, that is helpful. I, I also do not think we need to be in the um, housing <laughs> business, but we do have control over who these properties go to and how the properties would be used. And so I agree with that sentiment and I just wanted to um, make that clear. Uh, Dr. Benitez. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam President. And that's why I wanted to get um, clarification from Mr. North. Uh, I agree with you, Mr. Otto. We should be having this conversation in open session, but I still want to be clear on what I guess what threw me off is that we're being, we're being presented a recommendation as part of our board workshop that we're, t we're taking action on tonight. So um, I agree, Mr. Otto, that you know, this would be a better conversation for downstairs, but we're getting the recommendation up here on board workshop is I think the, the gray area for me. If, if, the, if, if I think I asked, I think this is what you, I heard you say, Alan. If we're being asked to vote on based on the recommendation to sell these three properties and take the revenues from those three best value, three properties to buy a new administrative office. Yes, I, yeah, yes, I, I think that precludes us from having the very conversation that board member Kerr and, and, and board member uh, Otto are, are alluding to because that's, that's a, then I know, okay, I, let's have that conversation down, uh, downstairs, here I go again, in open session, all right, tonight. Um, but if it, does, it doesn't preclude us, then I think, you know, t right now is a great time, and then downstairs we know we're voting specifically on that. So can, can you uh, re-clarify that, Alan? Is that what we're, the recommendation is? Yes, yes. So, so point of clarity, I just wanna be for the board's discussion here is as it relates to how we would market these particular properties i just wanted to be clear if it's a public offering to another another public agency we do have some latitude to negotiate uh, with those public agencies on the tran the transfer of that property 
as it relates to a private entity, whether that's a nonprofit or otherwise, the law is very clear and we have very little ability to control the who would offer and who would purchase that property. The, the law is very clear that we're, we're very much limited to taking the, that highest bidder as it relates to a private entity, whether that's a nonprofit or, or otherwise. Uh, so I just wanted to be clear about that point. Uh, the discussion about we target it to a certain industry or certain sector, we may be precluded from doing that according to Ed Code. Uh, but yes, the, the resolution being provided to you tonight uh, includes the recommendation that we do sell these three properties uh, and we use the proceeds of these three properties to relocate the administrative building to a location that provides better support to our community. Ms. Craigman. Ms. Kerr. Yeah, so in the resolution for tonight, um, in the last whereas on the first page, the last sentence is the combined proceeds resulting from the sale of all three properties could be used for the relocation of the administration building. That's in the whereas section. Um, so on the be it resolved section, there's uh, nine sections. And then in section six, it says staff to use all proceeds from the sale to the relocation of the administration building. So, so it has both languages in it. So the whereas I say it could be used, but the specific recommendation in the sections um, is that it would be used. Yeah. I, I quickly, as we go into this conversation, I wanted to interject here and thank you, Yumi, for reminding me of this. There is a process at, at the Department of Education where the, by which the board could ask a waiver from that, that competitive marketing process for a private sale. So I want to be clear about that. If we were to market this to private entities, there is a waiver process at the, at the California Department of Education that if the board so, so chose, we could, we could engage in that process to try to get a waiver from the, uh, from the Department of Ed to allow us to uh, avoid the open market offering and op open market uh, proposal. And I think that's a great part of a follow-up conversation that I would like to have and to explore and what does that look like, who's done it before, what causes were used. Um, but to the language piece, um, and this could be a conversation, again, I think it's important to have the conversation of clarity for me now so that when we have this conversation later, um, we typically have long meetings. Um, and lots of comment and sometimes I think in, some details can get lost in the, the length of it. So in terms of the language here where it says it could be used but then it says will be used. So it's saying we can do it and then we want to do it. I think a point of conversation uh, for tonight could be is, is that the appropriate language or is there an opportunity to put could be used again or do we want to stick to that? So I think if we want to have that conversation tonight during open session, um, the language piece of it feels like it will dictate how we move forward. And I think I needed clarification on what that looked like before I was being asked to vote on it 15 minutes. So I appreciate that we can have this conversation in both spaces uh, when everybody's here to be able to, to respond. I don't know if I have a question after that. I'm just noting the language in the two spaces. Mr. Otto? Yeah. Well, to, to, to a certain extent, to bring this full circle to the point that I made earlier, um, I wish that I would have had um, this report about facilities last night because at, when I left my office last night late, uh, I drove by the property on Long Beach Boulevard and uh, uh, and and the, the, not, not, our, not our building, but just to see what they look like uh, so I could be more prepared for this. And he gave me all the information that if I would have had that, I wouldn't have had to do that. But, uh, uh, but look, I, I think these are uh, profoundly complicated uh, decisions with a lot of information that we need to know about before we make these decisions. And uh, um, I, I, I think we need to assemble the, not, not only what the rules are that we need to abide by, but what the values are, our, our, our values as a community that we support, and we need to stay, state those things publicly. Uh, I hear for, for the first time that there's a waiver process and uh, 
So um, there's a lot to know, and uh, and 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 there's a lot to. I mean, I, I I'm right now I'm feeling like I'm unqualified to reach a decision about this, especially if it's not uh, urgent, meaning that it's got to be done right now, because I'd want to assemble that information. I, I sat on and chaired the planning commission in Long Beach for uh, for eight years, and, uh, and I'm a card-carrying member of the Urban Land Institute for over 30 years, so I know something uh, about land use stuff uh, and how it's changed, and I also know the, the need for uh, housing in Long Beach for families, and uh, if we can do something about that that doesn't undermine our financial position, uh, you know, these are all the kinds of things you ought to take into consideration, but I'm just starting to warm up to this issue and get the information that I need. That's all, that's all I'm saying. Mrs. Craighead, if I might speak on behalf of staff as well, that this is in no way meant to rush something that's an important decision. Um, but to make public the discussion, the priorities. And so as is always an option for the board tonight to amend the agenda, either to pull the item or to um, continue it to a, f to a future board meeting, to discuss it tonight and then to continue it, you'll have that option tonight as well. And so this is not a pressure point and it's not something that has to be voted upon tonight. So I'll just offer that to you as another option. Okay, so um, should we kind of have a consensus on whether we want to pull the item or not? I think you can do that tonight when you get to oh, the tonight. item on the agenda, or when you get to the agenda item. Early okay. in the meeting, you can determine how you'd like to proceed. So okay. tonight, when you get to item number um, 16, then you can discuss whether you'd like to take separate action or adopt the agenda as posted or amend the agenda in tonight's meeting. Okay. So we will keep that in mind for this evening's meeting then. Okay. Okay, Ellen. Um, so do we have any further um, questions or comments? Great, great uh, report. Great report. I mean, a lot of information, very good report. Okay, in that case, I think we should take a break. <laughs> So yeah. let's take a 15 minute break and then I'll, we'll work with staff to look at the agenda and revise the schedule slightly. Okay, okay. so we will reconvene at 1130. Okay. Thank you everyone.
everybody. It is now 11.30, so we will reconvene. Uh, at this moment, I'm really missing not having a gavel. I'll have to talk to Letitia about that. If I could have everybody's attention. I know. If I could have everybody's attention, thank you. Um, we will reconvene at this time. Uh, welcome back from our break. I know that's a long time for us to be sitting and uh, absorbing a lot of information. But it is time to continue with the agenda. So next we have a report from Human Resource Services, Mr. Zaid. Good afternoon, President Craighead, members of the board, Dr. Baker, and our online audience. My name is David Zaid, and I serve as the Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources. And I'm here to introduce uh, three members of our HR team, Janelle, Janine, and Heather, who are all three a part of our staffing team. And they are going to lead us through um, our all staff uh, demographic data, as well as our administration demographic, our new hire data, and then into our new teacher perspectives. And then I'll come back and talk about our um, equity and excellence efforts. So at this time, I will welcome up Janelle. Good morning. We're sort of in that mid-morning time, so... Good morning still. Um, my name is Janelle Harmon and this year I am working on elementary staffing. So if you have questions regarding elementary staffing, that is, or Head Start and CDC, that would be the areas that I am working on. Um, this year in our presentation, we're gonna talk about the ethnicity, administrative demographics. Uh, Heather's gonna talk a little bit about the new teacher hire data and new teacher perspectives. And then as David said, he's gonna talk about the equity and excellence. So I'm gonna give you just a quick minute to look at this chart. There's a lot of numbers up there. So if you have any thoughts you wanna write down and maybe bring up at the end. So I'm proud that we have a workforce whose ethnic backgrounds closely represent the identities of our students. You can see up here we have K-12 certificated, the CDC Head Start and Classified, as well as the overall population demographics of our workforce. Um, and we're comparing that to our student data. So while there are some situations where the demographics match, there are obviously quite a few areas that we'd like to have a closer match. Specifically in the certificated category, you can see African-American workforce is 9% compared to 13% of our students. American Indian is 1%. And while we do have 108 students, it doesn't quite register to a percentage point. Um, our Asian students are at seven, or sorry, our Asian teachers are 7%, which actually matches with our students. Same with Filipino, who are at 3%, matches with 3% of our students. Um, our Hispanic population is where we see a pretty uh, vast dispar uh, disparity between teachers and students. So 25% of our teaching force uh, identifies as Hispanic versus 58% of our students. Pacific Islander, we have 11 teachers are certificated, but um, it doesn't quite register as a percentage point compared to 1% of our students. And where we're overrepresented is in the amount of white teachers that we have. So we have 53% of our K-12 teaching population compared to 12% of our students. And then five, oh, I'm sorry, 2% of our K-12 certificated uh, identify as two or more races compared to 5% of our students. On the next chart, and again, I know there's a lot of numbers up there, so I'm gonna try to summarize it for you fairly quickly. This is where we're looking at um, gender by ethnicity. And while there are a lot of numbers, you will typically see that three quarters of the staff, almost in any ethnic group, are female compared to one fourth of the staff um, are male. 
Where this is significantly different is in the CDC Head Start area, where you see a lot more female uh, workforce than males. And then on this slide here, we're looking specifically at administrative assignments by ethnicity and gender. And so when looking at the diversity of this administrative team, this is at all levels, you see the percentage of white administrators is 44%, and that of African American and Hispanic administrators is almost equal at 23 and 24% respectively. And while lower in numbers, the amount of Filipino, Asian, and Pacific Islander does match with our student population compared to that slide that I showed you just a moment ago. And again, the ratio of female to male administrators in K-12 is about two to one. So obviously that doesn't match students. Students are 50-50 pretty much. Um, and it doesn't really match our teaching force either because our teaching force, remember, was three to one. So the administrators are somewhere in the middle of matching our students and our teachers. If you include the preschool numbers, again, because of the large number of females, it does get a little bit closer to that three to one ratio. And so when we look at this data, it's important to ask questions about how we can create a more diverse and inclusive workforce. And that's not just simply for the sake of checking off boxes, but it's because we believe that a more inclusive workforce makes for a better workforce, and it makes for a better, a better learning environment for all of our students. And I'm gonna turn it over to Janine. Hello and good morning. I'm Janine Sorensen, I'm the staffing analyst over high schools and substitute teachers. Um, so the next slide here is uh, in regards to age. So our K-12 principles by age group. So you can see on um, the ages are along the bottom and the total counts are along the side. And so a majority of our elementary and middle K-8 um, administrators or principals fall in the 45 to 49 age group where our high school principals fall in the 50 to 54 age group. And then on the next slide here, um, there's also a similarity with our certificated staff, so our teachers, um, with uh, the majority falling in the 45 to 49 age group, um, and just below that, the 50 to 54 age group with those, um, those numbers there. And so with about 339 in the 60 plus age group, um, we could anticipate or they would actually be eligible for retirement. So that's something we look at and consider. And then in our next slide, classified numbers are a little more even where the higher percentages of 15% are in the 50 to 54 age group and the 60 plus age group. So within the 50 to 59 and the 60 plus age group, there are potentially 980 classified employees that would be eligible for retirement. Okay, and that is in regards to age. So on to Heather. Good morning, I'm Heather Bigelow and I'm a staffing analyst and I staff special education along with middle school K-8 schools and library music and nurses. So we conducted a new hire survey in September of 2019 and 2020 in order to get a better understanding of the new hire experience, satisfaction and process from our new teacher's perspective. This survey continues to assist us in refining the hiring experience to ensure equity and e excellence. We asked about various things, including recruitment, previous work experience, primary interest in teaching in Long Beach Unified, long-term career interest or retention, and new hire perspectives. Many of our new teachers have a connection to Long Beach already, whether it be they live in the area or hear about us from a Long Beach employee. 
Many of our teacher hires are homegrown and have worked in different capacities with Long Beach prior to coming on as new teachers. As you can see, the majority of our respondents were at one point substitute teachers prior to hire or student teachers. About a quarter come to Long Beach with no experience in Long Beach Unified. Much of the interest in our district is because of our location, but also because of our strong student diversity, our competitive salary and benefits, and our solid reputation as a leading school district. This stays pretty consistent year to year. Retention is so important to a district as we need to keep the excellent teachers that we hire. We are proud that again, our new hires are hopeful to continue their career with Long Beach Unified. So as you can see out of 2020 to 2021, 76 respondents all responded yes, that they would like to continue their career with Long Beach Unified. Now that we have shared our survey data, we would like to have you hear from some of our new teachers. I think my experience in LBUSD has been amazing. I think the beautiful thing about being at this district, they really come alongside me and they make sure that I am well taken care of to handle the job that I've been given. Right? They don't let me just drown. Right? They have a lot of support around me and they've helped me kind of flourish. Um, I've had a wonderful experience. I, I can't say one bad thing about it. I mean, of course, there's stressful days and, you know, it's a roller coaster, but it's, it's been mostly up, which is perfect. <laughs> I've had a really good time. <laughs> um, luckily, every single site has had somebody amazing that kind of just took me by the hand and was like, okay, here's what you do, here's what you need to talk to, here's how you get set up. Um, which was super nice. Um, it actually made me like super comfortable. There's so many curriculum specialists too that are constantly giving us new resources to use. So as a new teacher, just having that accessible is also really helpful. So I, I feel very supported and it really makes me feel more confident as a teacher to have that. Um, I just always have someone to ask. If I have a question, I have, I have someone to ask. I think it's amazing being able to provide services for our vulnerable youth um, because I was part of that community and I am part of that community so I feel like it's it, it comes full circle when you're from the area. The staff, they are they are amazing. Uh, some staff noticed that I was struggling with Synergy, Elroy, some systems that you'll, that you'll eventually get to. They, they offered me support and help. I'm like, hey, you want to meet up virtually but I can help you utilize these programs. Um, I think LBUSD has a great um, and caring community, so um, I love that I have so many people that I can go to when I have questions or concerns. I really believe that LBUSD has the teamwork and the community that first year teachers need. Without like sounding cheesy, like LBUSD has been like my dream district to work in, so I'm trying to like put it into words that I totally feel like I made it. <laughs> so I want to thank our uh, staffing team. Um, the survey that we um, send out each year covers other areas that we each of our units use to refine our practices. But this year we wanted to do something different and have you hear, uh, not just see our data slides, but actually hear from our brand new teachers who have done an amazing job in a unprecedented, un extraordinary year. And so for them to have this as their first year in Long Beach and so be so excited uh, it is a proud to be LBUSD uh, moment. So I hope you enjoyed that. As we go to the next slide, I wanted to just share a quote with you that we used as a part of our recruitment efforts. It was a, uh, a quote that continued to, there we go. It was a quote that we just continued to, to loop, and it just simply says, every child deserves a champion, an adult who will never give up on them, who understands the power of connection and insists they become the best they can possibly be. 
Our human resources workforce diversity goal is to develop a diverse and inclusive talent acquisition strategy to recruit and retain a highly qualified workforce that is reflective of our students and our community. Uh, we know that representation matters. We also know that studies show that students of color uh, increase in test scores, they increase in that sense of belonging, uh, and there is a reduced likelihood of disciplinary uh, actions that are taken when they see themselves in the educators uh, that are educating them. Research also suggests uh, that Caucasian students show also improved uh, problem solving, critical thinking, and creativity uh, when they also have diverse uh, teachers. So I want to just share some of the action steps that were taken in the year 2019-2020 uh, uh, before showing you some of the results. The first steps that we took is we analyzed our current hiring practice and we took a look at any possible barriers to achieving workforce diversity with, with staff and with a consultant. And it was really nice to bring in an outside consultant who sat with us and talked about the equity and excellence and diversity that we wanted to see and then went through all of my our materials and said where is that reflected in the pictures where is that reflected in the words if this is what you want to see how do we ensure it is there and that led us to making sure that we were embedding equity um, in our application in our interview process in our materials. It also led us to professional development that we took part in full day professional development for all of our HR team, including our retirees who support uh, our interview um, uh, process. And it also included uh, a rev revising our district recruitment materials to ensure that it reflected the diversity of our students. One of the things that we were also able to do is redesign our recruitment effort. And so now when you go to the live and work Long Beach and you go to apply for any position, you now have an opportunity to see a recruitment video that really gives you what Long Beach is looking for, not only from the perspective of our staff, but from the perspective of our students. And for those who may not have seen that video, we wanna pause for just a moment and we want to share it with you. What our students have to say is really powerful. I look forward to the future in Long Beach Unified School District. We have just a fabulous team of people, thousands, who work hard on behalf of all students each and every day that are out there really trying to achieve the mission of every student every day. We have a proven track record of pushing the limits and setting high expectations, and our students have an even stronger record of rising to the occasion. A teacher can help you believe that you're just you, you're smart, you're yourself, you're intelligent, you're creative. Whatever you strive to believe in, they help you. As a district, we're really listening to what our students, what our teachers, what our stakeholders, what our parents are all saying about what's in the best interest of our students. Our district is looking at performance data and ensuring that we're looking at it through an equity lens and tackling the tough problems that we know exist and being solutions oriented. We believe in the philosophy of all means all, and that means that we want every student to receive the best possible education they can on any given day. Long Beach is a microcosm of the state as a whole. We represent California. 
We represent it in our racial diversity. We represent it in our language diversity. The students that not only speak a second language, uh, but the variety of languages that they do speak. We represent it in the socioeconomic level of our city and the diversity of that socioeconomic status, if you will, across our city. Long Beach Unified School District being as big as it is, we are really a tight-knit community. And we get that because we spend so much time collaborating together. We're looking for teachers that are excited, excited about teaching, um, they're passionate about it and you can see it. We're looking for teachers who are dream makers, who are risk takers and statistic breakers. To be a great teacher really means that you're willing to give your all. That means being pedagogically sound, knowing your content. It also means being willing to forge relationships with students. It's important to know that a lot of us are unique. We're not all the same. We have our own special kind of universe around us and everything we do is different. It's so important to differentiate our learning for our students, give them those tactile moments for them to be able to relate to what's going on, giving them those real world experiences so again, they can connect to that. We need them to be able to see themselves in what they're learning. What I can depend on in Long Beach is to be challenged intellectually, to be pushed to come outside of my comfort zone and try something new. While our first commitment is to help students, we are able to help them best when we support and guide teachers. When we do that, we have conversations around empathy-based communication, a conversation around equity. We've had a real focus on trauma-informed care and trauma-informed practices. The more that we teach teachers, the more tools we put into their bag and into their classroom, our students reap the benefit of that. The amount of professional development that we do has really been a hallmark of the work that has been in Long Beach going back decades. And so an educator who hopes to work in the district or who joins our team should really expect that their learning is going to continue. If you are enthusiastic about learning, you're enthusiastic about mentoring, uh, if you're enthusiastic about diversity, if you're enthusiastic about seeing great in everyone, this is the place for you. If you're considering teaching as a career, and you believe in children, and you believe in the power of education, and you believe that you can have rigorous high expectations for every child every day, I would strongly suggest that you consider the best urban school district in America, Long Beach Unified. I'm ready for you to see me as a human. I'm ready for you to see my potential. I'm ready for you to inspire collaboration. I'm ready for you to treat every student equally. I'm ready for you to listen. To believe in me. I'm ready for you to be strong. I'm ready for you to encourage me to ask for help. I'm ready for you to challenge me. I'm ready for you to work hard. To help me reach my goals. I'm ready for you to help me feel safe in class. I'm ready for you to help me feel safe at school. I'm ready for you to help me feel safe. I'm ready for you to have an open mind. I can tell you no matter how many times I watch that video, it resonates with me every single time. Uh, the most powerful piece is our students sharing what they're ready for as um, those who are considering work in Long Beach Unified get to hear directly from them. I want to share with you that uh, last year in fe on February 25th, uh, we decided to do something a little different. I really want to thank our staffing team. Uh, there are four of us represented here today, but we actually uh, represent an entire department of about 30 who were all on display and who all rallied to just do something different. What we recognized is uh, there was an equity question that we were using and that we were inspired to use. And the question is, when we are doing something, who's missing? Who's not represented? And so as we thought about our recruitment efforts and our participation over the years uh, at a variety of different colleges, the question was, at each one of those fairs, who might be missing? Who might not be represented? So as opposed to having a fair in the daytime, which most of them are offered in, we had a fair in the evening. And by hosting it in the evening, we uh, were able to attract many experienced teachers who 
are normally working in the daytime, they were able to come in the evening. Uh, to just share some of the numbers, we had 497 educators RSVP for our recruitment effort, uh, 380 for training, 81 for administration, and 25 for both because we did this recruitment event in partnership with our leadership development uh, office. Here are some of the photos uh, from it, but more importantly, what we want to share with you is what sort of results did we see? Uh, we set out with an ambitious goal, not only to identify the areas that were underrepresented, but to make sure that we improved in those areas. And when you look at our 2019, 2020 new hires, this is how many new people we hired to our district. Um, in comparison to the 137, you can see that for African American in 19, 2019, 2020, they made up 3% of the, in 2020, 2021, uh, that grew to 13%. You can see that Asian and Filipino both stayed at 7 and 7%. Uh, Filipino went down slightly from 3% to 1%. Hispanic grew from 27% to 36%. And uh, Caucasian went from 49% down to 31%. So when you're just taking a look at all of the efforts that were made uh, as it relates to workforce diversity and as it relates to um, just some of our efforts, um, you can see the data. Also taking a look at it based on gender, uh, you can see our gender uh, slightly improved by just about 2%, um, but we're continuing to work. So in conclusion, I just want to share some next steps with you. We're working to recoup some time. Uh, so just want to share some next steps with you. Uh, the first one is we are planning a virtual a certificated recruitment night in partnership with our equity leadership and talent uh, development department again that will be coming in April and we're looking forward to uh, sharing that uh, and getting the flyers out we're also continuing the analysis of our hiring practice we're continuing to analyze our interview scores and our new hire uh, survey data we're also continuing, we will continue to provide an annual report that measures diversification data and progress. That is a part of this report. Uh, and we shared a similar report in December uh, of last year. We'll continue to partner with our community colleges and key higher uh, education institution to develop a teacher pipeline. We have a current partnership with Cal State Long Beach and we are continuing to develop um, a partnership with Long Beach uh, City College. Through our um, development with Long Beach City College, we are sp um, specifically exploring electives that they hire that our students might be able to participate in from a dual enrollment. And so we're just in the initial phases of exploring the possibilities uh, with them. We're looking to develop preliminary teacher contracts and establish a criteria for identifying student recipients based on teacher elective courses. That's what I'm referring to at Long Beach City College um, as a way of, of course, building our own uh, pipeline. And we are continuing our anti-racist and anti-bias HR uh, trainings and professional development for our staff. In addition to that, um, there is some additional work that I'm involved in with peers and colleagues. So I'm a part of recruiting and retaining educators of color for Los Angeles County. And I'm proud to serve on that advisory committee where we're looking at this issue, not only inside of Long Beach, but in all of Los Angeles County. Um, and I'm also proud to continue to work on our equity policy 
as it might relate to this specific goal and topic. We'll also continue to solicit uh, student voice as it relates to really hearing from them some of the qualities that they are looking for as we continue to recruit and um, reach out to highly qualified staff that is interested in Long Beach. So that concludes our presentation and now we are at observations, suggestions, questions, thoughts, um, whatever you would like to share with us. Um, I'll go ahead and start with a, I guess a question. So we have partnerships with Long Beach City College, with Cal State Long Beach. What are our efforts maybe with our current high school students as far as um, a pipeline is concerned? Mm -hmm. So that's uh, something that we've explored and that's something that we're continuing to explore with Cal State Long Beach. Uh, and so we are looking at forming some teacher interest clubs. Uh, we were looking to carve that out of some of our social justice pathways. And so that is something that we are exploring. And we've had a partnership with Cal State Long Beach where we've had our high school students go and tour. And we're continuing to look at how we can grow that specific specific program. Also, I just want to add, I think probably one of the best questions we can ask is who's missing mm -hmm. so that we can um, attract a more um, diverse uh, group of applicants and also to be more inclusive. And I think that's a question that would translate across a lot of different um, Absolutely. You know, departments or, or even other entities. So thank you for that. And I know that event was very popular because I tried to attend that <laughs> event at Cabrillo and circled the parking lot and the surrounding area for quite a while. I could not find parking. So thank you for including those pictures too. Thank you. We had about, uh, well, we have 497 who RSVP'd and we have all of their contact information and we're able to continue to send them uh, information. Um, but it was a packed house. We completely filled the auditorium and we had an overflow room where we had an additional 70 that were in the overflow room. Uh, so it was uh, tough. We'll do that virtual. And the good news is we can get everyone in this year. Um, but let me just say, that is a really good problem to have. It's a really good problem to know that many people want to come to Long Beach uh, to, to, and to look at not only who wants to come, but why they want to come and to let them hear from our students on what our students are looking for and what we're looking for as we continue to pursue equity and excellence. Uh, Dr. Benitez. Speaking of Cal State Long Beach, uh, Madam President, um, so I, I think I love the question around high school uh, students, mm -hmm. pipelines and high school students. Um, Cal State Long Beach got a grant uh, about three years ago to um, expand the pipeline of students of color going into t teaching uh, careers. And um, as part of that grant, um, I was asked to lead some community focus groups and um, very interesting uh, that we found when we asked high school students and we asked some of the parents of high school students um, about their perceptions of teachers. So both students and parents, uh, and we interviewed a majority students of color. Uh, I think it was 86% students of color that we interviewed across all races and ethnicities held a very high regard for teachers um, and educators. Uh, in general. But when we asked, do you want to be a teacher or do you want your child to be a teacher? No one said yes uh, right. to that question. So I think our uh, teacher credential programs in general, but specifically Cal State Long Beach, recognize that there also needs to be a big community education piece. Uh, because when we delve deeper and ask why, um, uh, right, we got some very interesting um, result, and namely that although there was a high regard for teachers, um, it depended on where those teachers were. And mm -hmm. so there's this vibe out there of what a challenge it is 
uh, for all the great things we can say about being a, you know, the best urban district. David, I like that line. Um, there's also this stigma associated with what it means to be a teacher in a district that's 88% students of color, 67% poor, uh, right? So my, my question, uh, David, is um, given that the benefits of having a diversified cadre of educators are very clear, uh, as evidenced by students, but just all the research shows, right? The benefits of having a, a, mm -hmm. a diversified cadre of, of educators. Um, we have the data, 53% of our certificated employees are white, 75% are self-identified uh, females, 89% are 40 or over, um, and, and we have an 88% student of color district. How can we establish targets uh, David, and I love that we, you're, you're already short us, you know, in that one year period, we have improvement, right? Uh, but what's the basis for us considering, you know, how, how challenging uh, it, it is this last year? How do we establish any, how do we know that we're being successful at, at diversifying in ways that are both viable, but also equitable, David? And, and I'd love to get your thoughts on sort of how we, how we think through that. Sure. And what I would what I would share is that uh, that's something that we're thinking about not only here in Long Beach, but it's something that we're thinking about just for Los Angeles County, because we have to look at how diverse are the teacher uh, credential programs, who's going to those programs, and that's um, why one of the most popular um, uh, initiatives is the Grow Your Own program which you can see just in the data, Long Beach is very successful with. So when you look at the fact at that 20, uh, 20 something odd percent were former students of Long Beach that are now our employees, live in Long Beach, or in some way worked as a classified employee or worked as a college aide, which I'll just say many of us in the room were college aides. I was a college aide, also went to uh, a Long Beach school. So there are opportunities for us to grow our own, but I do believe that we do have to set targets and benchmarks and how we're going to measure that success. And that's what I'm looking forward to with our work with our equity policy. So I'm looking forward to um, continuing to set what that work is going to look like and what should our targets be and how are we going to measure that success. We are measuring uh, the success as it relates to retention and we're measuring the, the success as it relates to their experience and the support that they receive. And that's all a part of the new teacher survey. We didn't include those slides today, but I do have that data. And so we have a very high retention rate, but the, the, the question is, is how do we continue to improve the diversification as it relates to our new hires each year? And we did show improvement this year in just one year's uh, work of efforts, but that's the continued work. And we're hoping to not only do that work, but to lead the county and lead the state with that work. Dr. Camarino. Yeah, I also wanted to share with our work that's very strategic and the work that we're doing with Pathways, we have been for a w several months, a, a little over a year, looking at strategic ways in, into which we can bring a teacher credential or teacher type uh, mm -hmm. pathway to our schools. So it's a matter of making sure that it be kind of becomes from the school needs and not necessarily something coming from the district. So we've been looking at different uh, schools and different pathways that we can perhaps even change into a teacher pathway. Mm -hmm. I do agree with you, Dr. Benitez, that there are a lot of myths out there around teaching that we do have to dispel. Uh, I had an opportunity to work with students and I asked them, what do you think a teacher's starting salary is? And they said, I don't know, 20,000, 15,000? Couldn't be more than 25,000. And when I explained and showed our actual salary that we were starting at uh, a little above 56,000, 
not only was that where you start, but when I began to explain all of the pathways and career choices that you can explore in the field of education um, and how you can continue to grow, uh, eyes opened up. And so when I began to explain uh, to students, tell me what you want to do and are you interested in changing the world? And when they said yes, and I explained that education is the place where you get to change the world one student at a time, then their eyes began to open. And I, I think we have to continue to do that work so that we can change the narrative and our students can see themselves not only as students of Long Beach, but coming back to continue to build uh, this city and community that we love. And I think on that note, um, unless there are no further questions, um, we'll go ahead and move on. But thank you so much for the presentation and, um, and for the team also. And so we will move to uh, language accessibility and planning. As Mr. Tagorda is going up, I just want to um, remind the public that this was an item that the board requested be brought forth for a discussion um, to know what is, go what is taking place with language accessibility in the district and also to have an opportunity to make recommendations, ask questions, and help us to think more broadly than we have at this point of um, the future of language accessibility. Thanks once again to the board for uh, elevating this really critical issue. And uh, again, it cuts up to the very core of the idea of equity and excellence in the Long Beach Unified School District. Um, when you talk to our translation staff, and you see them here today, uh, you'll often hear them refer to their work as one of being bridge builders. And the idea is that today, as my colleague Carmen Hernandez and I facilitate this dialogue with you on language accessibility, we find ourselves in that role as bridge builders. We're trying to connect the board and exec staff with our non-English speaking families and their perspectives and their needs, and also our translators' needs uh, in, this, in this puzzle. Uh, the, mes the message we carry is one of gratitude. Um, in preparation for this presentation, I had an opportunity to touch base with our district English learner advisory committee, and they are extremely grateful that the board has taken on this issue and, um, and engaged in its importance. Uh, conversely, on behalf uh, of our entire district, I do want to thank our translation unit, um, who, as you'll see in the, in the ensuing slides, they've done Herculean work uh, during the pandemic especially, but um, just in general in support of our families uh, amid unprecedented circumstances. I'm also grateful to our parents, particularly our DLAC members, who have been spectacular partners and have championed this issue. Th this presentation is a brief one, and the intent is simply to provide the board with a platform, with structure to engage in this issue over the long term. So we're going to provide some basic information on our present state. Um, we'll address some of the immediate and short-term, and also allude to some of the long-term needs and requests, and also share some stakeholder recommendations and how our district has responded uh, to those recommendations, at least in the near term. Um, a corollary to this objective is that our aim is to help deepen our understanding and appreciation for the operation of language access. You know, what does it take for a school system like ours to ensure that our non-English speaking families truly have equitable access to the information that's necessary for them to be partners in our work? So you're all familiar, we're all familiar with the public facing um, language access items. The 62 COVID-19 notifications that the district has sent out in English, Spanish, and Khmer uh, over the past year that averages out to about five communications a month or once every week in multiple languages. Uh, the 487 district videos on lbschools.net and YouTube since winter of 2019-20. 
this board workshop, our community forums, our parent university workshops, our kindergarten festival, education celebration, all the many different ways that our district interacts with our, fa uh, with our families. But beyond that, and beyond the visible, also want to help deepen our understanding for the IEPs that our parents are engaged in, right? Where they're talking very specifically about the needs of an individual child. The uh, translation of the instructions to help parents log their kindergartners into Zoom during the pandemic. The, uh, the translation of the 150 plus page LCAP that is presented to the board by the end of the school year. Like all of these things relate to um, the work that we have to do as a school system to ensure that all of our families, uh, including particularly as is the case here, our non-English speaking families have access to this information. So in terms of our present state, I'd like to ground our conversation around goal five, which is to support effective communication. You'll notice in the three bullet points under this goal, our three principles, the idea that it's two-way communication, not just one-way engagement, the use of multiple methods, and inviting diverse views into the communication process. There are obviously ramifications for this in terms of our equity and excellence agenda, particularly for our Spanish and Khmer speaking families. There are also ramifications for the communications audit that the district has embarked upon and then as we think and contemplate these ramifications, we want to consider our current capacity. So right now, um, we have a translation unit that um, was transitioned from the Office of Curriculum Instruction and Professional Development over the past decade plus, uh, and into the Office of Equity, Access, and College and Career Readiness starting at the beginning of the school year. So amidst all of the changes with the, with the pandemic, there was also that transition of staff. Uh, at OCIPD, we had 5.5 FTE, including five Spanish translators and a part-time scheduler. Uh, upon the transition, uh, we, we, we lost the, the, the scheduler, uh, and we have four current translators and a vacant position for a Spanish translator. So we're in the process right now of hiring that fifth translator. Uh, that's the current capacity that, that our unit has. Now you ask yourselves, how do we address the needs of all of our families uh, in light of this capacity? Well, we, we think holistically and systematically about this work, right? So there's ongoing collaboration taking place. Uh, and you can see that right now. Uh, in this board workshop. We have two of our Spanish translators uh, translating in Spanish, um, Gloria Perez Abse and Gloria Rubalcaba. They're here to represent our EACC, our staff. Um, we also have, um, providing Khmer translation, um, two individuals represented by external providers that help us with our board meetings and other functions, uh, Sinu and Bo, who are here, um, translating in Khmer. We also have Khmer staff, but they're not full-time members of the translation unit. Uh, we draw upon their expertise from, um, one is a classroom teacher, one is um, part of the parent university team, another is part of um, Office of School Support Services. We have a collaboration with the Office of School Support Services, uh, particularly for IEPs, so they have bilingual texts. All of which is to say that it's a district-wide effort. Not to mention the fact that um, there are thousands of employees that we have in the district who also provide in some form or another some kind of translation or interpretation support. And although they do not report to the translation unit and EACCR, we have to consider when we think about a systematic approach to providing language access that we have staff throughout our schools with this capability uh, and, and how do we unlock that in a strategic fashion so that we are consistently uh, uh, addressing the needs of our families. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Carmen, who's gonna talk to us a little bit about the data, about the types of services we provide and, and what that looks like. And then I'll come at the end to engage the board in conversation around stakeholder recommendations.
Thank you, Robert. Greetings, Board of Education, President Craighead, executive staff, Dr. Baker, LBOSD colleagues, and our community joining us. Uh, thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of this important conversation around providing language access to our stakeholders, to our family, and our community. Um, we can all agree that during the pandemic, our communication within Long Beach has increased. And that could very well stem from goal five in support of communication and providing uh, that two-way support. And it can also fulfill what Dr. Baker alluded to yesterday morning with our equity definition becoming a practice and becoming an action. And so what we really wanna do is provide a little bit of a detailed um, description to you of what our translation unit and our colleagues engage in on a day-to-day -day basis with supports um, that we provide for our community. And so in this slide, we wanted to provide a layout of the needs and requests. So at the heart of what we do, as Robert alluded to, we are that bridge of communication. Whether we're representing the district, we're representing a school site, a particular teacher, we are that bridge to provide that access for that parent or that community member who at any rate would not be able to understand the message that is being conveyed to them. And so as you know, um, the volume of requests, we've differentiated between oral interpretations and written translations. Um, for the obvious, there are different tasks, but also to show the volume of, the, of requests that are coming across um, to our translation unit and colleagues. So they are just under 2,000 requests that have occurred from August 2020 to February 2021, which is when Robert also mentioned that the translation unit came into the Equity Access Office. And so a pause for celebration here is if you look at the line underneath, how many of those have been fulfilled by LBUS staff? So we have 97% of those oral interpretations that are being requested fulfilled by our own staff and expertise in addition to 99% of those written translation requests. It is very, very few the percentage that we are having to ask any external provider and that is simply because we don't have the capacity within our district to provide that language support. And so again, hats off to our team um, that you noticed in the slide before is very limited, but very mighty and very professional in the dedication that they have for our staff and our students. Um, and we also wanted to show the requests that are mostly in Spanish for both uh, oral interpretation and written translations. We also provide in Khmer, and then um, there are other languages such as Bengali, Vietnamese. Sometimes we do have additional Khmer and Samoan that are asked. In these next couple of slides, what we wanted to do is we wanted to disaggregate the types of translation and interpretation and the complexities involved in providing these services. So if you will, imagine with us that the requests become more and more individualized as we move up this pyramid. Also consider the degrees of complexity that are involved, the degree of skill, uh, the varying possibly resource or intensity, and the level of relationship building that occurs during these interactions. So when we're talking about a district meeting or written communication, a lot of times it's information sharing. When we go into a school site meeting or a school site communication, that individuality, individuality or maybe even intimacy, if you will, becomes closer, right? We're building those relationships, we're information sharing, but at times we're also information gathering. Uh, Dr. Kale alluded with her team yesterday that there are opportunities for us to gather information from, um, from our parents and from our stakeholders as well. As we go to parent support, think of this as learning that occurs for our parents. Right? And so when we're setting the stage through Parent University, through any type of Canvas support that we've laid for our parents, that intimacy and relationship building with our community and with our families continues to grow. 
And if you consider an IEP, which is the most individualized we can provide for a specific family, for a specific student, that bridge, that relationship, the, the stage that is set between the school site, that team, the case carriers, that family and that student, really happens within that context of an interpretation and that communication. In addition, we also wanted to highlight um, not just a bridge of communication, but also if we go back to what our goal is for our translation unit, we want to provide high quality, appropriate language, and meaningful access. There's also a commitment to system-wide specifics and practices. As Robert again alluded to, at a, uh, at a site, a staff could be called upon on any occasion if they're bilingual, even to the smallest degree, to make a phone call, to um, translate maybe an attendance letter sent by a parent, talk to a parent maybe at a gate. And so we want to be intentional in equitable practices, not just within our translation unit and our colleagues that support us, but also across our district to say, these are the sophistication and professionalism that are tied to building a bridge of communication for our families. So again, going up that pyramid, the knowledge of language, we want them to obviously be bilingual and to be able to vacillate, go back and forth between English and whatever the other language is that's needed. Moving up though, we want a common terminology. There's academic terminology, medical terminology that's necessary to be able to convey that message, both orally and written. But then we have district specific terminology that we would need to allow others to become accustomed to who are coming alongside and also providing this service. And at the top, we want to always adhere to those professional standards of impartiality, accuracy, and confidentiality. Those professional practices that would be expectations for everybody who's engaging in this type of conversation and communication building with our families. So really take into account that the work that we're doing is a bridge to convey a message, to facilitate dialogue, and to set the stage for a safe and welcoming environment. As a result of the recommendations that we've heard from our various parent groups, we have replied with short-term responses, but we're hoping that this is a springboard into a dialogue of long-term planning and responses for our stakeholders. And Robert will close us in this portion. The board is obviously very familiar with many of these recommendations because they've come to you, um, especially during some of our board meetings. They've also come in various forms through our District English Learner Advisory Committee over the course of multiple years. So I wanted to present them right now and talk to you a little bit about some of the short-term responses that we put together, but acknowledging that the short-term responses are gonna need to be leveraged and pivoted to a much more holistic and strategic response over the long haul. So the first is simply a Spanish and Khmer oral interpretation that enables two-way communication. And this is particularly challenging in a virtual environment. So um, you know, some of the tools that we use like Zoom or Google Meet uh, have very limited capacity when you're trying to create an environment where simultaneous uh, or um, um, consecutive interpretation is occurring, right? Um, and in some cases, some families have grown frustrated because um, in, in a particular meeting, if the technology is not, not up to par, what would happen is I'm speaking, I'm the speaker, and I will give two, three sentences, we'll pause, and then we'll have to translate in Spanish. And then if there's Khmer, there's, we'd also have to translate in a third language. And it can become very challenging to follow a particular meeting or it could lengthen the meeting to a point where engagement from our families can, can be constrained. 
So our one response right now is to, uh, to create these conference call lines so that our Spanish and Khmer uh, families and participants can call in and there's a translator that's providing that kind of translation in real time. Uh, the challenge to that is we have to always remind our speakers um, to pause to ensure that the translation can take place and that we enable um, our, our, um, our uh, non-English speaking families to be able to engage in the dialogue. In terms of the second recommendation that, that um, alludes to sufficient interpretation capacity for all stakeholder district and school meetings, this is a, an ongoing DLAC recommendation. Basically, it's to have more staff that can provide this kind of support. So like I mentioned right now, we're in the process of filling a vacant Spanish position, um, but there's probably um, a desire from our stakeholders to think a little bit more, hol more holistically about how that might be. And it could include as well um, very structured and strategic professional development for any staff member at a school site who may engage with a member of the community in a different language. So we're not just talking about like hiring more staff necessarily, we're also thinking about how do we provide ongoing to support to individuals who can uh, pitch in at a moment's notice. Uh, written district and uh, school communications in the parents uh, or guardians native language is another one. Um, so here we've tapped into some of our external providers for additional capacity. So mind you, the, the, uh, written, tr the written translation can take anywhere from you know, a couple of days to weeks, right? When we think about translating a document like like an LCAP, for example, that, that can actually take weeks for it to occur. So thinking about like what kind of capacity would be needed for some of, the, for, for some of these issues. And then lastly is just understanding the equitable digital access that our parents may be encountering. So how are they accessing currently um, the communications that the district is providing? And the way we've thought about this is to employ multiple venues for communication. So in some cases, we'll use Zoom. In other cases, we'll use um, YouTube live stream. In other cases, we'll use a conference call line. There's a, there's a desire for our stakeholders to have multiple methods by which they can access the information so as to ensure that they're capturing what they need to support their students at home. So with that, uh, we're concluding our presentation now. Happy to entertain questions or ideas from the board. We recognize that this is just a snapshot right now uh, for, your, um, for the board's edification and also for the board's contemplation. Um, but I wanted to end again by thanking our, our translation team for their efforts to support our families. Carmen alluded to it, you know, they, they are not only translating the language itself, but they are actually creating relationships with our families. So they play a very pivotal role in how our parents and our families um, come to know the district. So we want to thank them for all of their efforts on the front lines to, to ensure that they are serving our families to the best of their abilities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Kerr. Uh, yes. quick, quick question. Can you tell me how the conference call uh, feature works? Um, uh, absolutely. Um, what happens is at the beginning of a meeting, uh, the presenter will say, here is a line for Spanish, and here is a phone number for Kamai. Okay. And the, the parent will call into that line, oh. and they are, while they're watching the video, mm -hmm. are able to listen on the conference call line to the translation. Got it. Okay. The advantage to it is that they are also able to speak to the translator on that conference call line. So if they have a question, they can say, when there's a break during the deliberations, can you please ask them this question? Good. Ms. Kerr. Thank you. Um, thank you, Robert, for the presentation um, and being responsive to the board's request and to the, the whole team that's been doing incredible work. It's not just information. It's not just um, building relationships. It's an emotional endeavor to relay some of this information. So thank you to the team that's been doing that work uh, so much this year. I just had a quick question, and you, you briefly touched on it. I appreciate it. This, in number two on that slide, sufficient interpreters for all stakeholders, district school meetings. And it goes into, um, this isn't really a quantif under equitable practice, it doesn't seem to be a qualifications slide. So 
here's my wondering around it. If, is there a certification process required? Um, I know like medical translators have to go through certain training, court translators, um, but professional standards and job description as one of those ideas, you talked about professional development for existing staff. And you know, wanting to ask the question, if, is there availability potentially to partner with our, our community agencies that are already serving our multilingual communities to provide some of their interested folks in that kind of professional development and do a community partnership where we're hiring and when we're contracting that we're, we're using our own community members who already have some of those existing relationships. I mean, we talk about it, an internship program that we have students who translate for their families all the time back and forth. Um, so looking at our older students, but understanding that there's a knowledge of language, a common terminality and professional standards within that. But I would hope that we could entertain the idea of not just building up our capacity internally, but really reaching out to our community partners who already exist and are doing this work very informally to bring them into the fold, to have the training that they need to be um, even more efficient at the task as they work with us as community partners. Yeah, that's a great point and um, one that we've done, I would say sporadically, but we could, we could embark upon in a more strategic fashion. So I'll give you an example. Um, last year when we conducted our LCAP community forum, we, we had some translators there. In some cases, we would tap into the translators from our community-based agencies, right? Uh, so we're working in partnership with Latinos in Action, for example, or the Children's Defense Fund to ensure that there's breakout groups that um, are, are Spanish language and Khmer language um, families can engage in. Um, so that's one way that we can increase capacity, certainly. But I think there's, there's certainly room for engaging them in other avenues as well, not just in terms of community forums, but in, in some of these other really discrete areas where they can provide some, some support. Right, because we're, even though that number um, of outside contractors is small, I think it would be important that our first look when we're just, you know, when we're hiring, is we hire the folks who we're already in relationship with and in our community. Um, so I would love for you to help tease that out. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Dr. Benitez. Thank you, uh, Robert and, and the team. I think this is a good uh, start. Um, you, you asked us to contemplate a little bit, uh, Robert, and, and, and quite frankly, I've been contemplating about this for a long time, and, and I had approached our superintendent uh, about it as, as well. Um, here's, here's where I'm at, and it's in large part due to um, my conversations with our mostly Spanish-speaking, but not exclusively Spanish-speaking parents. And as, as you were going through this, um, I thought about my own parents and my own uh, education. I, I'm gonna challenge our, our, our exec team here and, and our district um, as a whole, because I believe that, that we can and should do uh, more. The, the challenge is this, um, if we use the same equity lens that we've been championing, there's a technical piece to this, right? And you lined out some of the Zoom stuff, teleconferencing, both limitations and, and opportunities. Uh, but to me, there's also that values piece that we talk about that includes respect. And, and quite frankly, um, the, 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 the lack of faith in our value around language access has been magnified the last uh, year. And it's not so much around intent and hard work and how great our, our um, current interpretation and translation is when it works. It's more around the inconsistencies. And, and that's why I asked, and, and, and I thank my colleagues for the support for, for this audit to take place, that much like where I, um, felt we ended yesterday, and I was hoping that we would uphold that today. Uh, the acknowledgement is not just around, here's what we're doing, uh, but I think it's important for our community members to hear and feel the acknowledgement around those areas 
that we're either not doing and not doing well um, that are not new uh, to us. And so I think if we start with the three levels that were laid out for us today, there's district communication going one way. Um, it saddens me for us to systematically not um, uphold, it saddens me that we're redirecting folks that either do not speak or are not comfortable speaking English back to those platforms. And I've heard it in small spaces, I've heard it in our large district space, that if someone is having trouble, either with the interpretation or the technology, I think we've just grown accustomed as a district, and this is a challenge that I'm posing, to redirect folks to the YouTube video that was translated, or to our online platform, or to the website, uh, as sort of a, a, a go-to uh, strategy. And, and I think that's where we lose, yes, technically, you can access this video, you can watch it later on Parent University, you can navigate our website, but where does the value uh, for engagement and two-way communication fall there? And I think that's where oftentimes what I hear and what I've observed is it heightens the lack of faith that um, whether it's a principal or a teacher or a district staff uh, to say, that's so that's what I'm so then what am I doing in this space that what am I doing uh, in this forum or in the CAC meeting or in this community meeting that is in partnership with our district if I'm going to be referred back to those resources which if I had access to them you know I think about my parents and I think what they would feel right now and it's what parents are communicating to me to be told and sort of, and, and, and again, I'm not saying in a discriminatory way or with any malice, if you can't, if you, if you need to see this PowerPoint, you know, refer back to the website. If interpretation is not working for you, watch the YouTube, uh, right? So there's that one way communication from our district out that I think we're over relying on at a time that we can um, be better uh, with that respect. And it's not to take away again from all the work that's involved in providing those documents. The second layer is around school site communication. It saddens me to hear that we are, and it's good intent, right? But good intent doesn't oftentimes uh, result in good outcomes. That we're relying on staff that just because they can speak a language other than English, um, not no knock on them, that we are not systematically thinking about why are we sort of on the fly relying on folks at the school site level to one, serve as that bridge that I heard so eloquently expressed today, but two, to then dismiss the technical piece that we so highly regard in this district, which is, again, there's a technical language to do interpretation. There's a skill set for all the goodwill that I have that I speak Spanish, I, and not a good example to sort of plug in, and I'm very confident in my language skills in Spanish, it's not good for me to be relied on to interpret on the fly, and I think we've also gone to that as a default, all right? And so for parents to express that to me that, you know, it's not the office assistant's fault, it's not so-and-so's fault, our community is showing more grace and compassion because they understand the challenging times that we're in, but systematically, it's leaving us off the hook. Third, and, and, and you brought up the IEP, so I'm gonna talk about the IEP. IEPs are supposed to, by policy and by everything that we do in practice, drive services. Um, by their very nature, right? They're supposed to drive services to parents. So if parents feel and have expressed to whoever that is, that there's an inconsistency in the interpretation that's occurring, whether it's uh, simultaneously, Robert, or you know the different options that we define. With the translation of documents, that's a huge, again, a huge issue. And, and I know that, because I've been in those spaces, we've heard that, uh, right? Um, and I know that we address that on an, on an individual basis, but, but I haven't seen 
and I, and I know this is a longer conversation, systematically, uh, sort of as part of this audit, um, how we, as we do with the equity uh, leadership team, how we engage beyond the DLAC that's already there by compliance, right? Beyond the ELAC that's already there by compliance, beyond the CAC that's already there by compliance, the technical piece, how we engage in conversations around, um, like we do with our budget engagement. Uh, what is the need of our communities specifically around what, they, what would work for them in one-on-one -on -one meetings? What would work for them in parent-teacher conferences? What would work for them in IEPs? In much the same spirit that we engage with our stakeholders around, you know, beyond the, it's included in the LCAP, it's in one of our goals and we wanna fulfill that. Uh, let's invest in that uh, right now. And if that means we need more interpreters, if that means uh, this teleconferencing uh, system, whatever that means, that at least we can say in an authentic way um, that we're systematically approaching this and not putting our staff, our parents, for all the goodwill and intent in a situation where they walk away or leave a meeting and think, this district doesn't really care about me. This district doesn't care about my students with disabilities. At a time where we've been highlighting for a day and a half that we do care. At a time where our principal gets emotional describing home visits where our teacher gets emotional reading emails to us, where I'm about to break down. I'm not crying, board member. Are you crying? I mean, that's what I feel, right? I'm not crying, you crying? Uh, that I would love to have heard, and I can hear it at a future meeting, the systematic aspect of this. And it's not to trivialize the individual, the, the short term, but that acknowledgement is missing for me, uh, right? And, and that's the challenge to me that uh, this is the opportunity to invest in a way that then gets back to coherence and alignment, um, leverage with all of our other equity efforts that I can talk through with what principal, um, I'm gonna lose her name, that principal at Stevens, Megan, uh, is doing, uh, uh, that what Renaissance is doing, uh, what Dooley uh, is doing, and that that then resonates with parents because the parents that are talking to me look at those things and that's why I always ask as a one-off, right? Why are you, is that only going on at that school? Why is that the only thing that's higher? Because that hasn't been my experience. So I'm all about cheering on, pulling out the megaphones, feeling like, hey, let's highlight what we do. But I think it's at the cost of parents leaving like they've and feeling like they've been disrespected, not heard, uh, and, and, and we mystify, then, then is this smoke and mirrors, right? Then is it just a fluff show at the end of the day? So that's the challenge. I, I, I do it in the spirit of my last words to our superintendent yesterday were, I am so glad that I'm in this space. I am so glad. I, I feel good that, about what we're doing. But then I feel um, that I leave these meetings with, with a vacuum. All right, on the coulda, shoulda, because we have all the verbiage right, and we have awesome examples uh, of it. But I know that at my next community office hours, I'm gonna get parents saying, uh, Juan, what the hell is happening, right? Because we hear this, and yet I just had another meeting requesting an IMP and, and, and being told we have to reschedule because we don't have an interpreter uh, available. So. I, I share that again in the spirit of, I believe in what we're doing. I'm, I, I think uh, we're on the right track. We're much better than we were 10 years ago, but I think the systematic piece of it is missing for me. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and uh, Robert, we thank you for your work, your team's work. Um, I think I would be remiss in not thanking our sign language interpreters who are here just behind you by I'm sure six feet or, or more. And um, it's been wonderful having our sign language interpreters at board meetings. I know that's something that um, started kind of recently. Um, 
But these, yeah, these are very important issues that, uh, that have to be brought up. We have to discuss them because that's the only, the only way that we're going to make progress. That's the only way we're gonna uh, go forward with that. So unless there are any other questions or comments, Dr. Baker? Sure, I'd just like to also thank Robert and Carmen um, and just acknowledge like bringing something into the light is what we're talking about. And so if that means acknowledging it in a certain way, um, today is the beginning of doing better. And so thank you for the discussion, for your comments, Dr. Benitez. And um, I think that we will be activating to bring a plan back for review by the board. And it's not something that we can change instantaneously. These are systematic, these are systematic inequities that have been built and perpetuated and not broken down, but we're here now in this moment. So appreciate that. Um, I want to also offer thanks to Dr. Anderson, principal at Browning and Michael, and he's been in and out, the um, janitor head custodian at Browning, who has helped to make us feel welcome, and also Letitia Rodriguez and Julie Krupp, who have been taking care of us to be in this space today. Um, this is a new workspace for us where board meetings will be held, so we wanna, we wanna definitely express our appreciation to the Browning team, especially for, for having us in their home. So thank you for such a good day and a half of discussion and for moving us forward from the place we came in. Monday, when I stood and talked about excellence and equity across Long Beach Unified School District, I look across the room, every division of this school district has been represented in some way in their work in the last day and a half. So really glad to be able to, um, I'm really proud to be able to have our team here with you and to listen and to, to be able to think about their work relative to your, your board vision and your board discussion. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, so with that, we'll adjourn, adjourn this uh, workshop and we will have our um, open session public meeting at five o'clock this evening uh, right here in this room. So Mrs. Craig, you, let's remind awesome. the community before we go offline that public comment is still coming in through the call-in system. And so we don't want the public to be confused because the board is meeting in public. There actually isn't any public comment coming in tonight to the building. So that system um, actually, what you would have submitted for this meeting, you would have submitted by noon today. Um, but for future meetings, it's the day, the day before the board meeting by noon. Yes, thank you. Um, so we are meeting in person as a board and a staff, but we are broadcasting virtually and we'll continue to do that until further notice. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>